What's a mook? A mook? What's a mook? You can't call me a mook. I can't? No. I give you a mook. Hey, it is a mook. Christmas! It's ho, the ho, most ho. wonderful time of, of the, the year. year. This is, hello everybody, this is Movies with the Mooks, our very special Christmas episode. Kevin Rosmer here. And Oliver Drossen. Here to talk about holiday films in this special Merry Christmas episode. Uh, because we all love a lot of different holiday films, you know? I mean, I have some that I'm personally very beloved to me. How about you? Uh, for, yeah, yeah, no, like Halloween and Christmas. I think those are like the two best holidays, at least for m- movie adaptations, you know? As much as I love my Easter movies, they just don't compare yeah, or to the your, Christmas ones. <laughs> or your Thanksgiving movies, which would be like the one they just put out this year. Yeah. Which is probably the first Thanksgiving movie I can think of. Yeah, no, I've been waiting like almost... 20 years for that Thanksgiving movie, and Eli Roth finally did it, but... Uh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're all set. We got our, our candy, our mandarin oranges, our turkey stuffing potato chips. Shout out to our sponsor, Western Family. Just kidding, they're not our sponsor, but I just wanted to let you all know that if you go to Save On Foods, you can get s- turkey stuffing chips, and they're great. So that was just me being a good Samaritan telling you about them. Did I say our, our, our espresso martinis? We're drinking espresso yeah, martinis. Yeah, here, here's a little, little clink there. Clink. Cheers, man. Cheers. Mm-mm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're recording this just uh, probably just like a little bit over a week before um, Christmas itself. But, uh, you know, we've been rewatching some of our old classic favorite Christmas movies as well as uh, bringing in a few new ones that I think, uh, you know, both me and Kevin can talk about tonight. But we're mainly going to probably focus on our all-time favorites, you know, the must-see Christmas <clears throat> films. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking, what's our format going to be? Because I sort of thought we'd talk about a little bit about a variety of Christmas themes and then kind of wrap things up with our top five yeah. each or top ten total kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, or mu- the must-see ones, anyway. Mm-hmm. Or the, maybe the ones, yeah, you always, you know, you go back to every year or every few years. Um, you know, I've, there's also, I mean... The, there's some great movies, but there's even some great, you know, um, Christmas, you know, TV specials also. Um, and, uh, well, I guess, yeah, I guess we'll talk a little bit about a bunch of them. Um, well, maybe we should start on that topic of TV specials and shows, because mm -hmm. I mean, one of the obvious things to touch upon is of course the Rankin Bass movies of, that have come out over the years, you know, starting with that, uh, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I think that was the first one, actually, that they oh, was did. It? Hey? Oh, okay. That makes... I think it was the first one. That makes sense, because... So they were all, like, stop motion. Hey? Yeah. But I don't know. I, I, maybe it's me. I, I'm always a little bit harsh on the Rankin-Bass ones, but Rudolph, um, just the designs of the characters seemed especially a bit simplistic, which maybe is why I was kind of thinking, like, that makes sense if that was the first one. It was maybe kind of like the first test run yeah. To sort of see how it goes. And then from the success of that, I think they maybe got a little bit more elaborate maybe with each Christmas special after that. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny because that's like definitely the most classic one. You know, that's the one that everybody remembers the most. Oh, okay. I would say, wouldn't you? Uh, I mean, it's, I guess, I guess so. Um, is Rudolph the one that has the abominable snowman in it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Then, yeah. It's kind of the most iconic, the characters. That, and I think that actually... Might have been the origin of that song too, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. I could see I think that it was written for that special. I wonder if that was also the case for um, Frosty the Snowman, because that was Rankin Bass, but that was uh, mm. Cell Animation. It wasn't stop motion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wonder if that's where the song came from, or maybe the song came first, and then they decided to make the cartoon based on it. But um, I know that the story of Rudolph was something that first appeared in kind of like a comic strip or something or not not a comic strip but like a little magazine or magazine insert something like that yeah because he was never part of the original reindeer group like i think it was um a night before christmas was the original i think story that created all of the names of the reindeer oh interesting okay um and rudolph's not in there uh he kind of became this like add-on later on so 
in some ways, yeah, he's kind of like still sort of like a recent character. Like, I don't think Rudolph's more than, you know, 60 years old, probably. Yeah. Um, um, well, let's see. How long ago was that? That came out in like, that would the been like 60s, mid 60s. Sure. I want to say like 65. I got to look into or that. 66, just maybe. Just to get some, some official yeah. clarity. The three big uh, Rankin Bass stop motion Christmas ones I always kind of think of. I'm sure there's probably some more, but the the three I always think of is Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, the Little Drummer Boy, <clears throat> and then I think the other one is called is it just called Santa Claus is Coming to Town? And that's kind of um, like yeah. And then there was like the Jack Frost one I think too. Right. right. So Rudolph came out in 1964. Okay. Little Drummer Boy. Uh, was 1968. Okay. And then, well, there, there, there was um a year without Santa Claus. Yeah, a year without a Santa Claus. That was 1974. Okay. And I think Frosty the Snowman was like 19, maybe 1970 or so. Yeah, let's see. Um, for some reason, I had the feeling that they like cranked these out like oh, every 1969. Okay, yeah. I always thought that like every year they cranked out a new one, but I guess uh, they were a little bit more sporadic than that. And then by the time, you know, we were growing up, they would just kind of air them all on TV and you'd probably just think like, oh, okay, they were all, we probably just thought they were all aired around the same time. Well, that's just it, Um, right? Because we would have grown up kind of having the benefit of just, they all existed, right? But mm -hmm. everybody else kind of would have gotten them gradually. Do you have a, so is Red, is um, um, Rudolph, is that one your favorite? Well, yeah, definitely one of my, uh, you know, <laughs> so one of the things that I love about the movie is just how mean all the characters are. Like, okay. You just, I mean, you've seen it a lot of times, right? No, like I don't oh, even think I'm, I, I, I don't even know if I've seen it from beginning to end. Wow. Yeah. I watch it at least once every year. Okay. Maybe even multiple times in a year because... I don't know. It's that nostalgic. But ever since I was growing up, there's actually my dad has a video tape of me and my brothers watching it when I mean, I'm literally like one year old, maybe they're a few years old. And so it's literally been this thing that's been present in my life since uh, as far back as I can remember. But I just get such a kick out of how you've got... Rudolph's dad, who completely rejects him over his black nose. Then you've got, he he goes... Wait, he gets rejected for his black nose? Or, sorry, for his red nose. Oh, okay, that makes a little bit more sense. His dad, like, puts some mud on it and tries to conceal it or whatever and makes it all black. And then uh, he gets rejected by, like, the school athletics coach and all of the his fellow students. And (laughs) he gets rejected by Santa Claus. Um... And then, of course, there's my favorite character is like the mean elf who doesn't want to. He's like, Hermie, aren't you finished with painting that doll yet? <laughs> it's just. um, I, I don't know. I think it's kind of hilarious how all these characters are just like so blatantly mean. And then later on. When they're putting on this performance for santa claus the guys the, the the elf's voice totally changes and he's like all right guys now let's get ready to put on this show for santa <laughs> here we go and then that sounds santa, familiar and then, and then that, santa that, like I, yeah. doesn't like the song <laughs> and he storms out and this is just a, that's just another case where he's just being like mean to everybody mm-hmm. and then and then the guy's like that sounded terrible <laughs> <laughs> so he's like this like two-faced changing. elf who yeah yeah, yeah gotcha yeah. yeah no see stuff and, like that sounds great that sounds like my kind of a yeah, thing it's hilarious i and i think that it's it's one of those things where i feel like too much modern stuff has gotten very kind and kind of cuddly and w- w- what do you call that coddling whereas well, in those days more likely they were it was more common it seemed like they were going to show characters that were like these these blatant assholes and it was funny yeah well i mean you need to have villains or if you're not gonna have villains you need to at least have some sort of um uh contrast in characters where you've got some sort of an antagonist in some way Mm -hmm. it's just so boring uh if just and that was kind of what i was originally kind of thinking with these rankin bass things is they just seem so nice and 
cookie cutter. I just kind of assume that they wouldn't have any edge to them whatsoever. Um, well, I think they do actually. Well, That's it's one of the things I like. About it, it does sound like um, whether. Uh, it came before or after the song or at the same time. Uh, it does sort of sound like an extended, yeah, sort of variation of what the song is, just kind of played out over, you know, maybe like 90 minutes or well, something. Well, that's just it, yeah, yeah. It's it's the whole story of, well, <laughs> I've seen some some memes floating around lately that are like, the moral of this story was you will be rejected by society unless they discover a way to exploit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. in many ways, that's kind of the way that it is with Rudolph is he's rejected by all these people, you know, for having this this um, characteristic that makes him an outcast. Everybody insults him, makes fun of him and rejects him. And then as soon as they need his help, then they suddenly come around to trying to like, un, you know, befriend him all of a sudden because they're like, oh, we can we can use this nose of yours. And now. And now, you know, he's the hero of the story. <laughs> and it's just, there's there's no um, kind of retribution in a way for how they how badly they treated him before other than he's just now accepted yeah that's kind of what it seems like he's like <laughs> he's like oh like all that abuse is forgiven now i'm just part of the team yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, um yeah, yeah. but uh <clears throat> mm-hmm. well but anyway i would recommend checking out those those movies more but again it's it's one of those things where maybe if you didn't grow up with it it's not going to mean a whole lot to you, but to me, they're ex- extremely nostalgic and special, and it always gets me in the mood and the holiday spirit. Yeah, I guess I always assume by the time I did get around to knowing that these things existed, they just always came across looking very kind of like babyish to me. Like they, mm-hmm. like I always got the impression that they were meant for like five years old and younger, so I kind of just sort of dismissed them for the most part. And also, yeah. I think I, I had just seen from a young age, I'd, I'd just seen so many things that it was a little bit difficult for me to, uh, I don't know, just have the attention for, for that stop motion stuff. Um, but you were also a fan of their Christmas spe- or their Halloween special, right? Uh, that actually were... was, li- I didn't grow up with that as a kid. Uh, that was actually oh. in my adult that I saw a mad monster well, party. That's really interesting yeah. because it's like you developed an appreciation for that. Mm-hmm. But haven't really done so maybe with the with the Christmas ones so much, or I don't know if you care about Little well, part, Drummer. Part Boy of it is or... well, part of it was also just I felt like the design of the um, characters in Mon- Mad Monster Party seemed a little bit more elaborate, I guess. While the oh. ones in um, in the Christmas ones just very they looked they literally looked like just kind of like toys like from the sixties, which I guess yeah. is the idea, but. Um, compared to maybe the action figures that I had, I was just kind of like, ah, oh, like this just seemed, uh, um, not really my thing. My sister, I don't know. She, she loved those Rankin Bass, um, uh, episodes and, um, I don't know. Yeah. I just kind of, uh, never really gave them a chance. I guess as far as more like the sixties kind of, there was other stuff from the sixties that I kind of did gravitate towards. Like, I mean, I had no problem with, um, the Charlie Brown Christmas, which was also around mm, that same yeah. period as the Rankin Bass ones. I don't know. Did you grow up much with uh, <clears throat> the Charlie Brown Christmas no. at all? Because that's like kind I'm, of the I'm, big one. That's like I the have, big. I have seen it, but I, I am not super familiar with it because I didn't really get to watch that one so much when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, weirdly enough, with that, I think what's become the biggest legacy with that special more than anything is actually the soundtrack. My, my dad was big into oh, jazz. I, I love that music yeah, so, so much. That was playing always a lot. Uh, just those jazz renditions of, uh, yeah. of classic, uh, Christmas songs, but it was all from so, Charlie Brown. Yeah. And speaking of which, cause earlier when we were like coming down in the elevator and getting ready to set up, we were talking about, um, how one of the things that we like about Christmas is this sort of melancholy that comes around with it. It's not all just the holly jolly vibes and, and, positive things and good things it's this sort of sadness in a way yeah and this melancholy and I, I that's one of the things that i love so much about that charlie brown song the whole um you know christmas time is here happiness and cheer like that song is such a kind of depressing song yeah but and i think that might have been an original it, that might have been one of the original song like i don't th- remember ever hearing that <laughs> Before no, Charlie no, Brown, I'm, I'm pretty right? certain that it was made for yeah. by the guy who did this soundtrack for yeah. Charlie Brown, 
And uh, that's the one that I always think of, too. And, like, to me, that's like probably one of my favorite Christmas songs just because of that whole, I don't know, melancholy kind of depressive. Yeah. But, like, there's just something comforting that I find about that, too, even though it is sort of sad and depressing. It's like... Well, it's almost like Peanuts... <clears throat> And Charlie Brown was almost meant for adults, or I maybe you could say it was meant for everybody, but there was such mature, like Charlie Brown's a loser. Like, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm, I, it took mm -hmm. me a long time to realize it, but Charlie Brown is supposed to be a loser where nothing ever goes his way. And I think a lot of adults can relate to that. And, um, um, and yeah, it's like, there's two types of Christmas movies. There's the kind of like joyful, merry Christmas movies, which are usually the ones geared more for children. But if you're, Anything that's kind of geared more for adults is usually the ironic Christmas movies, which is, if anything, kind of almost the opposite of being merry and cheery and kind yeah. of like you're saying, a little bit more on the depressing, kind of maybe sadder side. What do you mean exactly by the ironic Christmas movies? Because I was kind of wondering that when you, when you said it earlier, too. Um, well, ironic in that Christmas is not supposed to be a depressing serious oh time. i see what you mean and so basically any to me any christmas movie that's kind of got a a dark spin or an edgy spin or is kind of just maybe a movie that's not really celebrating christmas as much as it's yeah. commenting on it yeah um, or almost lamenting it in a way yeah yeah because uh, i think that's that's the thing is for a lot of like adults who are kind of you know, you kind of get jaded. You don't really, you're not going to buy a wholesome movie about Santa Claus. You kind of want a movie about adults <clears throat> and, yeah. you know, maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a drama or maybe it's a dark comedy or maybe it's even a horror, uh, you know, Christmas movie. Um, there's even also, you know, there's also your action, uh, Christmas movies. So, um, you know, anything like that to me is like an ironic Christmas movie where you're right, they're actually right, putting right. a spin on the holiday as opposed to trying to yeah. represent it on what the holiday is supposed to be about usually yeah. or what it's what it's typically branded as yeah. I guess and those yeah. are usually the movies that also get the most debate over are they Christmas movies mm. because of the fact that they're kind of ironically playing that spin on it you end up getting all the classic debates of is Die Hard a Christmas movie you know mm -hmm. uh, is is Batman Returns a Christmas movie uh, yeah right right um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah. And I don't know, I guess as I get older, I, I guess I gravitate more towards the ironic ones. Although if I can find, you know, a wholesome Christmas movie that really makes me feel good, uh, I'll definitely appreciate it. It just does get hard. Like you get less well, sentimental, I think, as you get older. It's like some of them are a little bit of a mixture too, because in some ways you could say the Grinch is very ironic and that he, you know, he's like a cynical guy. Um, it's not exactly a feel-good story for a lot of it, but by the end it is. Well, it's got that quality we were talking a bit about before the show where there's kind of that classic Christmas trope that was probably originated with A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. And there's been other movies that have done it where it's like it's usually dealt with a lot of... It's a character who is, who is a Scrooge type. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. Grinch is fits into that gr gr the Grinch is the Scrooge of Whoville right who you know comes through, around and yeah then... yeah so it does end with a very wholesome note but it's yeah. like it, it would never feel as wholesome if not for all of the grumpy Scrooginess you have that leads up to um the big finale yeah and uh, yeah I think in some ways those are some of my favorite kind of Christmas movies when it's that and I can relate <laughs> to that being that piece of shit asshole who's just like fuck <laughs> this shit and then I don't know. And then something well, happens that makes my heart grow three times and you know, then it's all good. Ultimately, probably most Christmas stories are going to have a little bit of an element of that, right? Because, I mean, every movie needs to have some drama. So there's going to be something that's not quite right mm -hmm. in Whoville or whatever, like wherever you are. Like, um, it's just great when the main character is the antagonist, you know, like, right, which is right, Scrooge see, or the Grinch. It's like, usually they're like the villain who you see it from a distance, but when mm -hmm. he's the main character you're following the whole time, there's something kind of hilarious mm -hmm. about that. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. the Grinch is a pretty hilarious character. I, yeah. What are your thoughts on this? So I actually, so I'm going to actually say it. I, I think I actually prefer the original animated Grinch over the live action one. Um, maybe just because well, it was the, my intro to it. And um, I don't know. I guess to me, it's just it's a little bit more pure as far as an adaptation of the Dr. Seuss I could see story. That. Definitely. That's true. That is absolutely true. 
but the thing is, to me, this, there's just not much to it. It's like a short nursery rhyme. I think it only lasts, but it's like half an hour or something. Yeah, hey? I think so. Yeah. So it's kind of more like a TV episode. Mm hmm. Um, and to me, one of the things that I love about the actual, like the, the Jim Carrey Grinch movie is for one thing, Jim Carrey, I love Jim Carrey and also the production design and kind of digging into the world, I guess a little more. And I don't know, seeing, seeing that the, the excellent job that I think that they did of bringing that world to a live action type of, uh. Oh, they did a great job. Yeah. No, yeah, no, there's no yeah. denying that. Yeah. I, I really find that I get, I find myself much more immersed in that story and in that world from the Jim Carrey movie than I, than I do in the animated film because the animated okay. one yeah. is just kind of a little bit too story bookish. Well, it's just, it's, it's, it it's a quick, li it's a short much. little, it's, it's really, a, it's a slightly <clears throat> extended version of of the book and yeah, not much more yeah. than that. And that's where um, it's harder for me to, to go along for that ride and, mm -hmm. and really and get I swept away by it. I do got to give props to my Rick Baker. You know, he's my favorite makeup artist and he did all of the uh, makeup for, uh, <laughs> for, for the Grinch. I don't think Jim Carrey's would agree with you. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> well, uh, um, you know, Jim Carrey like had a miserable time in that makeup. Thing. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm sure he I'm didn't enjoy it. I'm just making a but... joke about how, <laughs> how he probably isn't uh, giving props to Jim Baker in that sense. <laughs> well, because I'm, he's I'm, just like, fuck, this was the, one of the most miserable acting experiences I had. Yeah. But, Although, I mean, it probably, but he did a great job. He, but he, visually he, on screen, it looks amazing. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure you admit that, you know, the, the ironic thing is it probably would have been even more miserable had it not not have been Rick like Rick Baker probably made that makeup as as comfortable as possible based on what was needed while if it was mm -hmm. even somebody less I bet I bet it would have been even more torturous for yeah, Jim yeah but um but it's 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 a great um I, I also like I love like I love like baby Grinch <laughs> oh yeah yeah um, and yeah, but also, who was the kid that had to put that on? I'd like to He was know. actually a little person who I think passed away not long after oh, uh, the really? movie. Was, well, the, see, the, the, so there's Baby yeah. Grinch, which is like, like a puppet, and then there's yeah, like right. school schoolyard Grinch, who oh, was a little course. person. Yeah. Um, but also the Who's been... the Who's look great too. Their makeup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They do right, like with their little like the noses, noses and, and stuff, everything. And yeah. It's like yeah. it's kind of subtle, but it's really well done mm -hmm. totally like sold it you know it doesn't look like a makeup job it just looks like these yeah weird people well that's the, again like i just um it, it was a weird like i think i think in rick baker's case like you know at that particular time he wasn't doing a lot of super friendly like family friendly kind of movies but i think at that point he, he was having his own kids and uh his own daughters actually play little whoville girls in the movie oh, nice. itself and so i think he was like oh i'm gonna do i'm gonna oh and there goes our uh, air mattress. I don't know if that was hurt at all. That um, was, yeah. <laughs> we just had our uh, backdrop fall over. You can probably hear yeah. the echo even better now. Luckily, it fell <laughs> away from us instead of towards us. We were wondering if this was going to happen. I, I really thought those cushions were going to hold. <laughs> okay, hold on a minute. We're going to pause for a second, reset this thing up, and then... <laughs> I just think that's hilarious that that happened yeah. in the middle of our recording. One sec. <laughs> Okay, we're back. We got our sound barrier system sorted out there. Good stuff. Okay, so back to the Grinch. Yeah, one of the things that I like about the Jim Carrey Grinch, well, the Jim Carrey Grinch and the Grinch story in general is just that it does have a bit of that edge, kind of, you know, that we're talking about. Like, yeah, again, being this asshole character who's mean and does, like, careless heartless sort of things i think the grinch is hilarious like i think he's a great it is yeah it's a dark sense of humor you know? right like it's a movie with a dark sense of I, humor I, I don't i'm sure that they did this in the movie uh because it says it, to me it's such a staple of the grinch story and stuff but to me this might sum up like my favorite element that goes all the way back to the book and i, I hope <clears> it's in every rendition i know there's actually i mean there, wasn't there just a new grinch like a cgi grinch oh, that just came out so bad Oh, so you saw it. So this is where, like, it looked it looked pretty rough. This is exactly what I mean in terms of today's society not being willing to go to that dark place. They have to be too coddling. He's not a mean Grinch. He's like nice. <sighs> he doesn't he doesn't treat his dog like shit. He has to like 
sort of half-heartedly be kind of mean to his dog, but really he loves it his dog. It almost sounds like the like, sequel. It almost sounds like, oh, he's so, he's become the good Grinch, and yeah. now this is his follow-up. But it's, it's just so stupid and watered down. But, I fucking hated it. I thought it was horrible. Well, the thing, and I'm curious, I bet you they probably did this in the new Grinch. If they didn't, then this just proves it's garbage. Mm -hmm. But the thing to me that sums up the Grinch more than anything is the element of he's, you know, he's, he's in one of the houses, and he's just torn everything he's taken the tree the presents everything mm -hmm. and then right after he leaves there's like a little mouse that just finds a little crumb and he comes back and he yoinks the crumb mm -hmm. out so that mm -hmm. even the mouse doesn't get that to me like that sums up the grinch more mm -hmm. than anything just that like that perfect no little detail for his meanness, yeah right? yeah like even a little mouse gets nothing on <laughs> on christmas yeah. and um and yeah, and I think there was also a lot of edge to dr seuss himself he always to me had that kind of raw yeah. doll quality where he mm -hmm, was kind of mm -hmm. like, I'll entertain children, but I don't necessarily have to like them, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Right. Uh, you get that a lot from, from both of those guys. And yeah. again, I just think that, I don't know, people, that whoever's making this bullshit movies just is, is too timid to go down that path. They're like, no, it, it has to be nice. It can't be too mean. Um, it's kind of like the fucking Cruella movie that came out where... She actually loves dogs because you can't have somebody hate dogs nowadays because uh, dogs are so sweet. It's like, no, have her have her want to, you know, shave the freaking dogs for off. You don't. Yeah. She doesn't have to be a dog. Lover. I, I like, hate how fuck. and um, I won't talk long about this because it's not related. But, yeah, they seem to be doing a pattern of that with like those Disney uh, villain oh, uh, origin yeah. stories. I'm, Mal Maleficent where, is where another perfect villain, example. But they're not really that well, bad. It's, you find out they were just victims the whole time. They were good yeah, people, yeah. and they got fucked. And and sometimes that does work. I mean, villains are made that way. But I'm like, but can't you just have a villain who is just born bad? Well, you know? the problem is they just don't make them villainous enough. They make them too sympathetic. Like, well, and and just like like look, real villains are heartless and do want to do cruel things and i mean not all okay that's an oversimplification but it's just um i don't know they're just too too nice they're yeah just too like, nice there's to anybody who who's like a teacher or maybe even a parent like can see like some people are just shitty kids who grow up to be shitty adults yeah. you know and that does happen sometimes and well yeah 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 totally and that was another thing where um like another movie that does this well and has kind of a bit of a dark sense of humor and a bit of edge to it and stuff was um, A Christmas Story. Which mm, is I never really thought of it as having an edge, but I mean, I know what you mean in that. <clears throat> maybe not so much edge, but a Christmas Story, what Christmas Story does so well that a lot of movies today fail at is it's truly a family movie. It's not a kid's movie. It's a family mm. movie, which is maybe where that edge comes from that you're talking about, right? Because um, mm. there's a lot of stuff that's in there for the parents, not just for the kids. Yeah, like it's slightly inappropriate, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what was so great, like especially as a kid watching these things, because you either don't understand the appropriate things or you do. And if you do, there's no harm there. And if you don't, I yeah. don't know, something subconsciously is still very enriching about it, you know? Yeah, I yeah. love the, the sexy lamp in A Christmas Story. Exactly, yeah. Um, I like that. One of the things in A Christmas Story that always confused me, though, as a kid, I later understood it, but it's that kind of thing where it's just right on that line of edginess, and it's the part where the kid, the son is helping his dad with a flat, uh, changing a tire, mm -hmm. and then he, uh, he spills all of the, um, oh, God. The two holes of the screws or whatever. Yeah, and then he just goes, oh, fudge. Mm -hmm. And then the narrator's like, only I didn't say fudge. Now, as a kid, I was yeah. watching that being like, no, you clearly said fudge. <laughs> I heard you say fudge. Not realizing that it was a fuck joke. See, I totally understood that. Right. Well, you were because, probably much more much more intelligent well, than I was. No, I, under, I understood it because I had said fuck before when I was a kid and got my mouth washed out with soap. So I knew that it was like this bad word and this bad thing. And I'm like, that's... I know, I know what he's really yeah. saying. There. It, was, it was too meta for me because I was just sort of like, I clearly heard him say fudge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is this rewriting of history here? Yeah. But, um, but no, it's just, um, yeah, like, um, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, do we, should we just talk about a Christmas story for a while? Because I know yeah, that sure. this is one of both of our one of our favorites. You know, mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. might be even maybe my ultimate 
Christmas movie. There's there's other movies on my list that are maybe higher as movies, but mm-hmm. for m- representing a Christmas film, mm-hmm. I I don't know if you could find one that tops this, at least for me. Well, it's definitely um, it's definitely way up there for sure. Yeah. Um, hard to beat in terms of just how classic it is and how many things just classic sort of family Christmas dynamics it sort of touches upon that are so relatable. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things I like about it so much. And, you know, for instance, one of those things being that special toy that you want so freaking bad, but you don't know if you're going to get it. Mm-hmm. And you're maybe not sure if you are going to get it or not, but the excitement when you do, yeah. for instance. Um, What's amazing is it's like it's a movie that was, you know, was made in like the early 80s, um, but it's set in the early 40s. And yet, you know, you and me and generations of kids just seem to completely relate to this movie that is so yeah, before yeah. our time, you That's know? What's- <laughs> okay, so our fucking <laughs> backdrop sound barrier fell down again. At this it, point, it, it might be I a figure, lost cause. Yeah, I think yeah. we'll leave it. We'll Apologies leave it. for the echoes. And hopefully, there's not a ton of echo coming in <laughs> yeah. through here. It might not be so bad. But um, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, it's just such a, a, a so. I mean, so when I was a kid, uh, like my first girlfriend, I remember her dad. Um, I had asked him, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm literally five years old and I was just like, what's your favorite movie? And he was just like, oh, I think a Christmas story is my favorite movie of all time. Wow. And this is, who was this? This was my very first girlfriend's dad. <laughs> your five year old girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I remember even back then it was like, I, I love the movie, but just hearing an adult say like, that's my favorite movie, put more weight on it being like, yeah. wow. Like, like this, this is, is a an, serious th- movie. This is this is a, like this is a movie about a kid, and yet this man in his fifties like mm-hmm. loves this. But I realized that this was actually a movie that was probably set. He probably was that age. Um, yeah. When that time happened, so it was perfect. Like for him, it was probably nostalgia overload. Well, so um, it, it, did you say the movie's set in the forties? Early forties. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was probably a little bit after that, but like he would have been closer to that time, right? Um. Because my, my dad yeah. was born in 1952. I don't know oh, when your dad really? was born. My dad was born in 19... Uh, well, okay, my dad was born in 1943. Oh, okay, um, okay. So... This guy was yeah. a little bit older than my dad, so... you're okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay. He probably wasn't well, the age of the kids at that time, but, but it probably still wasn't too far off. But still closer to that yeah. range like my, anyway. my dad was old enough that, yeah, when he was a kid, he wasn't... They didn't have TV. He was... <clears> they were listening to the radio. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So even though, like, for my dad, even though he was a little bit older, it just... That's the weird thing, is it's like anybody who was born after that era seems to really connect mm-hmm. with this movie, mm-hmm. even if the childhood wasn't that close to it. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, just everything like, like the, the music it's got uh, it, weirdly it worked. Like it has a lot of the Peter and the wolf music. Yeah. Is, right. is a lot are a lot of the themes in it. But is it actually Peter and the wolf or is it? Yeah. Cause it's like that whole. No, no. That is, that is the theme of the wolf. Oh, it is. Okay, the the, the okay, Scarface gotcha, music. Gotcha. That is, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, they weren't using, uh, I think they only use like a couple of tracks from Peter and the wolf. They're not using like the, mm-hmm. they're not using like the iconic Peter theme, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very much kind of like, there's a lot of connections I feel with a Christmas story and Christmas vacation. Only a Christmas story is a, a little bit more wholesome. Too. Yeah, 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 like the National Lampoon's Christmas. Yeah, movie. but they both kind of have that theme of. Sure. I, I love the Christmas movie where it's like a family and the dad's trying really hard to make it a great Christmas, but yeah. things kind of go wrong. Um, and um, yeah, hilarity always seems to yeah. ensue from that. And we also recently watched um, the long-awaited sequel, A Christmas Story Christmas. Right. In fact, nobody was waiting for this, but it was a. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know what? This is well, actually this is actually the third sequel to a Christmas story. What? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. So there's one of there's one official sequel that's not Christmas. This is based. as big of a surprise to me as when we talked about Psycho having sequels. Oh, we can go even bigger than that. So I believe the the, the all of these stories are based on the writings of I want to say his name is Gene Shepard. I apologize if that's not his name. Okay. But uh, he was the original narrator of a Christmas story, and there I I kept. I knew that there was a few of these, but as I kept lo- like later researching it, because I would always watch a few of these like kind of pseudo sequels, and then eventually I'm like, how many of these are there? 
There's a motherfucking nine Gene Shepard adaptations. The they're not all directly linked to a Christmas story, but they all have him narrating and they're all based oh. on his childhood. So it's and like a series. It's a series. They all have like his childhood friends flick. Do they and, have the, uh, um, the cast, same cast? Or? No. So that's the interesting thing about the newest one is that it's the only one that's like a it's the only sequel that actually has the cast returning. There's actually a okay. movie called The Christmas Story Part Two that's from about ten years ago, and oh. it's and it's god awful yeah, from what I've been told. Okay. I remember seeing I remember seeing that on the shelves when it came out, and just thinking it looked stupid as hell. Mm -hmm. But then I heard about this new one, which I think just came out last year. Yeah, yeah, it did. And um, well, let's talk about that because I just watched it the other night. You also watched it the other night. I did, and then. What did you think? <laughs> I enjoyed it. So uh, I'll be I, I talked to Kevin about this uh, the other day about how I tried to give this movie a chance last year when it first came out. And I think I watched like four minutes of it and I was kind of just put off. I was I, I, I think it had to do with the child actors. Mm. I think I was just sort of like, oh, man, like everybody other than the main cast just seems it was like this weird clashing of like these actors that would in any other situation not exist in the like like um i was thinking about this a lot about how um uh what's the main ralphie the, the actor who plays ralphie and his mm -hmm, friends mm -hmm. you would never see those people cast in main roles in a movie today it was simply because they were the originals um right that and, they were brought back but it was stuff. really nice to see these kind of characters yeah. star in a movie but i noticed every new character was almost more like a cookie cutter version <laughs> of an actor of modern times hence like the wife okay. and the kids um so that was kind of the thing that put me off at the very beginning of the movie i was kind of like mm -hmm. oh this just kind of feels like this made for tv thing but i gave it a second chance actually <clears> after you had talked about it i was like you know what let me let me try it again and once i actually got past the first five minutes i started enjoying it more and more yeah. and i started finding oh you know what this really is doing a good job of um really referencing the original movie in many ways, as well as also kind of um, advancing certain things, right? Like I kind of enjoyed how they kind of um, uh, did a switcheroo on in the original movie. There was, you know, Flick getting, you know, dared into putting his tongue on a flagpole. Oh, yeah, while yeah. this one, they flip it over and they, <laughs> and Flick kind of gets his revenge uh, by <laughs> making the other kid, uh, well, now adults, uh, going down that um, sled ramp. Yeah. You yeah. know, and. Which um, is another great thing. Like, one of the things I love about that whole sled ramp scene and, and the, the pole scene going back yeah. to the. Is that that's such a, 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 such a relatable thing that you do as kids where you kind of, you dare somebody or. There's something that like people are afraid to do, yeah, and nobody wants to do, and there's an element of danger to it, and there's kind of this this fear surrounding it, right? And they're both timeless. Yeah, exactly. They're not they're not things that like th those sequences are not going to age poorly in another thirty years, yeah, as yeah, opposed yeah. to what other things you could maybe do. Well, and it can be easily translated. Like for instance, um, watching him go to the down the sled ramp to me was like. I don't know, maybe trying to hit some jump at the skate park or in some, you know, some bike jumps behind behind the gas station in the vacant lot or whatever. Like yeah. things like that that are it's not the exact same thing, but it's related. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, I don't know, it, it takes you back. It makes you feel nostalgic. And um, and it's so funny, too, at the same time, because, you know, <laughs> exactly you understand the trepidation that the characters are going through in both both from the perspective of the person who's about to do the thing and who's been challenged to do the thing as well as the people who are watching you know the the onlookers who are who are watching with a kind of fear about what's going to happen yeah but still an excited anticipation about like is he going to die <laughs> or is he going to live yeah i i, I knew he wasn't going to die but i was like something yeah, yeah. something's he's 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 paying this is retribution for yeah. what he did so i'm like this is not going to age well but it kind of it brought everything full circle you know mm -hmm, as far as with mm -hmm. flick and um oh, i forget i i always forget the other kid's name but um but it was just yeah it was just great it was like you were kind of hanging out with your old friends from the first movie exactly. and almost no time had gone by. Um, well, that's the amazing thing about bringing back that whole cast is like, for one thing, they all actually play their parts really well. None of them are like cringy actors. Like I'm totally no. sold watching the performances. And I don't know if they've even 
really been in much of anything. I'm glad you brought it up because Flick was doing porn in the 90s. I'm not I'm not oh, making this really? up. Flick was doing porn. Yeah. It um and uh and then the other guy did some stuff too. He would pop up now and again. I think both of them hadn't really done stuff in a while. <clears throat> um well, you know how it is with so many of those childhood actors, right? It's like they they do a few films when they're kids, and then they go off to do some completely different career, and yeah. they never look back. Yeah. It, one thing I will say, it was a bit of a shame that they couldn't have brought back Melinda Dillon to play the mom, but I understand why, apparently. I mean, oh. I, I think she passed away not long after production wrapped on the movie, so um, oh, she so probably... Did, so, so neither of the... The mom character wasn't the same. I didn't even know that. No, the, the original mom is the mom from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, actually. Right. Oh, and okay. uh, no, she's been in a bunch of stuff. I, I really like Melinda uh, Dillon, um, but I also so really like Julia Julie Haggerty, who replaced uh, the mom. She's also yeah. great, but it, it would have been nice, yeah, if you could have had the mom. But I under well, that was interesting because I assumed that they, because of course a big part of the movie is that. Um, What's the main kid's name again? Ralphie. Ralphie, yeah. Ralphie's the main the main premise is that Ralphie's father has passed away and he's going back to his old childhood home to, you know, celebrate Christmas without his father for the first time. Mm-hmm. And um I assumed that that was the story because the father actor had passed away and he was one of the people who wasn't there to well, had he had do lived, the new movie, but had he had lived, he would have been a hundred years old when that when the sequel came out. Oh, wow. So I, I don't think it could have worked, even if he was alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, but he was, and, and he's great though. Uh, Darren McCavin, I want to say, is the name. Uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, he he was a he's a great actor who'd been around for a long time, and he's yeah he's one of the highlights of the original movie. I, oh, yeah, I, I love yeah. the dad. Um, and uh, and yeah, but but you know they gave him a very fitting um, sort of tribute in the new movie. Although you don't see him in it, they've got you know photos of him, and they even you know take soundbite clips from the original movie of him. So yeah, I really I, liked I, that. Yeah, yeah. I, I liked that they had a few little throwback things where they just referenced a few of the old scenes, almost to to connect it to the mm-hmm. to the modern times in the new one, and, yeah. and almost to also just remind you of. It's like, hey, remember this? Remember what happened? Yeah, this it, little memory that it ended up actually working <clears throat> very well for the story because it kind of became this like passing of the torch, right? It was like, mm-hmm. oh, the dad dies, so now Ralphie has to be the new patriarch of the family and has to now kind of take on, um, uh, you know, step into the boots of uh, of uh, planning the whole Christmas out, you know. Yeah. So it, it, in a in a way, it really kind of uh, worked out. Like it was a, a good kind of structure. For the story in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it's, 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 I guess a part of it is having sort of grown up by this point as well. Like, obviously, we both watched those movies, the the first movie when we were kids. And so we would have watched it from the perspective of children. And then now we're seeing the story more from the perspective of the adult. And we're adults ourselves now. I mean, we don't have neither of us are married with kids but um that we, we can, know of yeah well, i'm um, i'm sure i've got you know a couple dozen illegitimate children out there but <laughs> but but you know it was what a I christmas mean. gift yeah that's 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 how you gotta look at it yeah um and I, I love the whole uh character arc of farkas oh yeah i know me too right? that, that was and, and <laughs> i thought they brought him back in such a great way like yeah it was <laughs> for starters i love the fact that he still has his like cackling sort of villainous laughter <laughs> but uh just the fact that when they bring him back he seems at first like he's going to you know take same like, old farkas like yeah do, yeah do do some other you know kind of take some sort of revenge yeah um but no yeah they they, they yeah they, he completely has like a turnaround and uh uh it's it's like a nice little surprise in the movie Mm -hmm. and um and they they delayed it too that was another nice thing was i was like because i was expecting earlier in the movie i was like i wonder if they're gonna bring that guy back mm -hmm. and then we didn't see him for a while and i was like oh maybe they're just not gonna have him but then he shows up and again in just a great moment where where ralphie is caught in a very um 
vulnerable situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I had a feeling I was like, they, they're definitely going to bring in Farkas because he actually yeah, as, like as, as, of the him. actors. He's actually one of the few that is um, more or less uh, a working actor still. Oh, like okay. he never really kind of stopped acting. So I was just sort of like, there's no that. way he'll, he'll turn down uh, this one. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Do we want to do we want to move on to any some other titles maybe? Or uh, I mean, I don't there's don't a lot I could say about a Christmas story, but um mm -hmm. But I don't want to make it all about that. Um, I don't know. Do you, do, were there other things you wanted to talk about about it? Well, or do you want to... Uh, yeah, we were kind of transitioning over into uh, National Lampoon a little bit there in the sequel. Yeah. And... Um, my my, uh, my parents were actually friends with the director who made National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh, and I really? always thought that was really neat. Um, wow. So, wait, did they shoot that in Toronto then? Or? No, no. He... Um, they just happened. He was originally, I believe, I think he was like originally like a photographer or maybe a cinematographer. And uh, um, Christmas Vacation was his first movie. That was his debut. And I think before that he was maybe doing commercials or maybe music videos. And from what I remember, the story was, was that he was a director for hire. They actually had casted somebody else originally. It might have been this other guy who worked a lot on John Hughes movies. I want to say it might have been the guy who made Pretty in Pink, possibly. But there was some sort of falling out or creative differences. So he was very quickly fired and they brought in um, my parents' friend, uh, this guy, Jeremiah Chuchik, who, who went on to make um, some other movies. But this was his first one. And I hate to say it, I think it's his best movie of yeah, all the ones he's right? made. I'm like, this one is his classic. Like, this is... This is the one that people have seen probably more than any other one. And it also is probably my favorite movie in the Vacation franchise. Yeah. I don't know how um, many of the Vacation movies you've seen, but... I actually haven't seen, like, hardly any of them, to okay. be honest. There's, I, there's like four. I only watched this movie, like, the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, I think a couple of years ago. Or maybe three. Oh, three. okay. Three, four years ago or something. Because this is one of those ones that like, I grew up with and watched it like every year. And, well, again, it's uh, one of those ones I'd been, I I knew that it existed and that so many people, it was this very beloved movie. Mm -hmm. I knew about it for a long time and just hadn't watched it for a while. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing that's nice about it is all the other vacation movies, they, they're going somewhere. But this is yeah. the one vacation movie that they actually stay home oh, and you okay. get to kind of like just see them just in their environment. Um, I mean, I don't know. Some people might argue that the original one is the most classic, but um, but I don't know, man. It's just I think a lot of people really dig um, the Christmas vacation. It's It's got that classic John Hughes writing mm -hmm. and um, the kid. The joke is kind of like the kids change in every movie. But oh, okay. uh, it's a pretty good cast of the kids they have in this one. It's Juliette Lewis in one of her early roles. Ah, and, yeah. um, oh, what's the guy's name? I forget his name, but he's gone on to do tons of stuff. He was on Roseanne and Big Bang Theory. Let me see. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, he was, he was rusty in it. Um, you know, you got Julia Louis-Dreyfus just before she did Seinfeld, playing one of, like, the snooty uh, neighbors of the Griswolds. But um, there's just a lot of great gags in this movie. Everything from like when the in-laws come over and, you know, they're just, uh, well, there's like the Randy Quaid family when they show up, just everything kind of goes to hell. And, you know, like, they're just, I don't know, the Christmas tree gets burned down. There's a squirrel inside of it. Um, you know, there's, there's the great uh, sledding sequence. Um, I guess it's just a movie that just has a lot of really great Christmas kind of just iconic Christmas uh, archetypes. Oh, just quickly, Johnny Galecki. There you go. Rusty yeah, Christmas. yeah. Um, and I think this was one of his earliest um, movies too. Um, but it's just a movie I find just very rewatchable, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you said you yeah. saw it for the first time just a few years ago. Is that right? Well, yeah, 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 exactly. And it is, it is a hilarious movie. Um, I love that whole thing where they're... Like, what is it? He, he's always talking about how they're going to get a swimming pool. That's the plan whatever. is that he, he's hoping for the big bonus yeah, that right. will let him get the <laughs> the pool. And it ends up being like a jam of the month uh, <laughs> subscription. Which is and, just like uh, such a hilariously relatable disappointment yeah. for, for anybody who's 
I don't know, done some sort of a job who then didn't get of the bonus that they were promised or anything. Well, and that's probably the best performance of Chevy Chase in the movie is when he has that rant yeah. when he finds yeah. out and he's just exploding. And it's like you could just tell like everything that was like he was just holding back through the whole movie. He just says every swear word possible yeah. in this yeah. rant when he gets that bonus. Um Although, you know, Randy Quaid, uh, the optimist, is always, you know, saying, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving, Clark. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, it's just, yeah, I, it's one of the best, um, I think it's, it, it really is one of the best uh, Christmas movies that is a must-see to watch every yeah. year if you can. And it's like, it's it's definitely more of an adult film, you'd probably oh, say. Oh, totally, because, yeah. Like, it's not it, a kid's movie. Although, you could be a kid and, and you can really enjoy it, you just won't maybe get as many of the jokes as if you're an adult. I, I think by the time yeah. you're a teenager, you're good to go with Christmas vacation. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, they, they totally, a teenager would totally love it. Even I, I probably would have loved it even as like a young uh, adolescent or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. But, but you know, I just wouldn't have been allowed. It's like, no, too much uh, swearing and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But, um, in terms of being a rewatchable movie, yeah, it's it's totally rewatchable. Much in the way like the Home Alone movies are rewatchable. Mm -hmm. um, the first two has, are at least. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's 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 just forget that all those other Home Alone <laughs> movies happened. Yeah, because we're, we're Team Culkin. Yeah, so. for sure, definitely. Well, yeah, okay, so that brings up a good point. I, I mean, I think I would know your answer, but like. The first two, like Home Alone 2 is actually, to me, probably like, you could put it up there as like one of the strongest uh, sequels <clears throat> of a movie. I, I don't know if I would say I prefer it to the first one, I but it's so close. I was going to say, so we, should, we should have the debate. I wrote that down on my notes. I was like, debate which one's the best, I, the I, first one or the second one? I think I would go with, uh, for me, and this is why usually the originals in general usually work in that, like, usually... As good as a sequel is, you usually need to at least see the first movie before seeing the sequel. So as a mm -hmm. standalone movie, um, I'd probably still go with the original. But the sequel does the sequel does everything right for a sequel, which is that it more or less gives you a carbon copy of the original. It just ups the ante in every way. And 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 I think it totally does that. I just don't know if that necessarily makes it <laughs> Better. I was just well. See, this is where I'm a little bit torn too. It is because more brutal. I, I I will say this. So so for one thing is you do get a lot of sort of repeat jokes as you often do in these in these sequels. Well, and and I don't think that that's actually a strength of sequels. Usually, like mm -hmm. you, you know, usually when I look to a good sequel, I'm like, what is it that it captures a lot of what you loved about the original, but still does stuff that's totally different, right? So it's, you could say Empire Strikes Back is not at all the same as A New Hope, mm -hmm. but it has a lot of what you loved about A New Hope while, while advancing the story and making it, um, and upping the ante, but also not repeating the same sort of uh, gimmicks or whatever. See, whereas, whereas Home Alone 2 does repeat quite a bit of the it, same gimmicks. Structurally... You know? it is almost identical other than just switching things out, right? Like, yeah, yeah. instead of scary old man neighbor, you got pigeon lady. Right. Um, I think and, it's and, and a lot in a lot of weaker ways, too, I would yeah. say. So, for instance, like, the pigeon lady story is not nearly as, as uh, emotionally um, effective for me as the, as the scary old man one. Or even mm. as funny. Like, you know, she's like, okay, a scary pigeon lady. But, like... The scary old man being this serial killer and stuff and yeah. you know, how Buzz is telling him the story about it. And again, that's a very relatable thing when you're a kid. You'll have like your older brothers or cousins or whatever um, kind of telling you some bullshit because they know that it's going to mm -hmm. scare you. And, and uh, they, they know that they're they're toying with your vulnerable mind. Right mm -hmm. now, the big question, wet bandits mm. or sticky bandits? Oh man, I think the wet bandits. <laughs> <laughs> See, again, it's 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 all about the it's, original because the original yeah. they were inventing everything, and mm -hmm. then the sequel was like, well, how do we, how do we just up the, how do we just recreate it but up the ante? Like, yeah. okay, well, we'll we got to move it to New York. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's <laughs> and, that's uh, the thing that I actually like more about the sequel is I find it much more of an exciting movie when they put him in New York City by himself because to me, then he's on more of an adventure, right? It's more exciting, although. It's probably as a kid less relatable. Like as right, a kid, right. I can relate to 
being trapped in my house while as a kid the idea of being left alone lost in New York would be yeah. like terrifying but even the, the aspects of like the way they go about you know that he in the first movie he has to kind of give the impression that there's a whole bunch of people in the house mm -hmm. while in the sequel he has to give the impression that there's people living in the apartment room with him mm -hmm. um, well that was another addition that I really liked just to touch on that moment is I love Tim Curry's character in the oh, second yeah. one and oh, the whole one of, hotel one of the best staff things. thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that was just yeah. like hilarious yeah. even Rob and, Schneider is great yeah, yeah I know I know all like that whole the whole hotel staff thing and mm -hmm. again both movies cash in on giving you a, a, a child's fantasy right so mm -hmm. the child's fantasy in the first one is being at home alone and you can do whatever you want you can watch all the bad movies you can eat all the ice cream and jump on the beds and you know yeah, yeah you get free reign of the house um, order your cheese pizza and stuff whereas mm -hmm. in New York again it ups the ante but it's instead he's got a whole city at his disposal you know the, the, the city is his oyster right yeah one thing I will say that the sequel maybe might do better. I don't know if I prefer like the abandoned apartment <clears throat> building over the mansion to the first film, but I do love how they were like, okay, for the last, like, like we're going to do the same structure, but we know why everyone, we know why the first movie was a hit. And mm -hmm. it's because of that last half hour when it's the robbers versus Kevin. Yeah. So and everybody gets to watch him terrorize and, yeah, these guys. Yeah. So they were and... like, we have to, we have to up that, <laughs> those pranks, <laughs> which is why, I, and it just never grows old on me just the brutality of kevin <laughs> whipping bricks <laughs> off of the roof and just hitting marv it's just or, like well, one of the best ones for me was when he gets electric and he turns into a skeleton yeah. briefly yeah <laughs> and no. then and then when harry <laughs> sticks his head in the toilet or he lights yeah. his <laughs> He lights his hair on fire, and then he sticks his head in the toilet, and it blows up. But what I love is, it's like there's a there's a delay, there's a brief moment where it seems to put out the flame, yeah, yeah. followed by an explosion, which yeah. which is in real life it would just be instant explosion. But um, yeah, like it's that's kind of you know like they know why everybody's there, and it's for that last half hour of mayhem. Mm -hmm. But um, but at the same time, the stuff that I actually re love the most rewatching it is actually usually the stuff. Like, I think as you get older, yeah, you start appreciating the smaller yeah. bits more. For yeah. instance, like that old man story uh -huh. where he, like, wow, that I mean, that can still bring tears to my eyes. Whereas I didn't really feel it so much as a kid. We well, you know that old man played Ed Gein in one of the best Ed Gein movies oh, ever. <laughs> so awesome. I wonder if that That's was a like a play egg. in on his like casting maybe. Yeah, it could have been. But um, also we, cause I know we, we love talking about our composers. The score by John Williams yeah, is a huge element. I think of why I love those movies it so is. much. Same here. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, the second one is better than the first because it takes all those original themes, reuses them, but does some different twists on them and brings additional material to it. Like there's that whole Christmas star song, mm -hmm. which yeah. is, you know, and, and again, that's one of my favorite parts of the sequel is when he's just in his hotel room and he's all alone and he's looking out the window and it's playing this beautiful piece of score by John Williams, the... Christmas star at home up in the heavens. Again, a very melancholy kind of vibe to it where mm -hmm. there's this sadness, this loneliness to it. It, it. it just touches on that emotion so perfectly for me. And it's him being out on this childhood fantasy alone in this fancy hotel, but having this sense of longing of missing his family and he has to go to bed alone at night, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so sad, but it's just a very interesting combination of feelings that it gets at. And I yeah. also love that instrumental when he does, that seems to be almost influenced a bit by Carol of the Bells, but it's his own sort of spin on it. Do you kind of know the one I'm sort of talking one I'm about? I talking about. Oh, well, well oh, oh, maybe, maybe no, it is no, no, one, you're, you're it is of, one big song. Uh, da, na, 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 na. Maybe that's um, what you're thinking of? Maybe, and, uh, maybe that's, that's not the part of it I was thinking of. Like, maybe it all flows into a different melody, but it's that, like, bum, 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 that's you know, just it. He, and, he really uh, expanded that score for the sequel yeah. in such a fantastic way. Yeah, like, yeah. Even like that, the opening so title more. song, you know, like that, like, dum, bum, 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 b
boom, yep, yep, boom, boom. Like, well, fuck, again, it's that was great. there in the original movie too. Oh, so it, sorry, it, it had I, some yeah. of those in the original. And you know, there's of course the classic, which is kind of the main theme. Yeah, but wow, those movies would just. It's it's amazing to me how much John Williams, how much value he brings to any of these oh movies God, because yeah. because they would just not have been hits without him. I, I feel not like nearly, I think it's, yeah, it, it's, I think so much of it well, it pivots on what like just it, just the life that he breathes. What it into does is it's it's and I like a lot of I think when a lot of people leave a theater they don't even understand why the movie affected them and yeah, it was the fact that yeah. you were manipulated and I think there's nothing that manipulates you more. Um, then when there's some really great music attached to the sequences. And so like they yeah, just leave the theater and they'll be like, oh, point. and they're like, that was really great. It's like, well, yeah, but why was it so great? I mean, a lot of mm-hmm. elements were great, mm-hmm. but that music just solidifies it, you yeah. know? Or sometimes and, you leave um, wondering why wasn't it so great? Yeah. And maybe it's in the absence of a great yeah. score. Oh, I've definitely you know? seen some movies where the score was so bad that yeah. it essentially ruined what could or, have maybe or, or been just, an okay movie. Or just nothing, right? It's just, yeah. it just didn't affect you. Yeah. And, and another thing, you know, we really got to just give props for to at least the first Home Alone movie is it's now been bumped off the list, but when that movie came out, it made the top 10 highest grossing movies of all time. Yeah, That's how that huge it was. That's incredible. And, um... And yeah, I mean, it pretty much was, I think, kind of like the most recent of those titles for a long period until, I mean, another until another 10 years happened when just every year blockbusters were just beating records. But it was almost like the yeah. last classic kind of movie that stayed in that top 10, mm-hmm. along with movies like E.T. and Star Wars and Jurassic Park for quite some time. Yeah. I guess Jurassic Park maybe would have been actually the last one on that list that, that just was uh, there for quite some time before breaking into the top 10 was almost like a nothing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, those movies are just, I think they'll just forever be classics. I think in time they, they will be seen as timeless movies that, that, you know, we'll be maybe one day showing our own kids too. And I think they'll like it uh, oh, pretty much just as much. Would. Yeah. But it's, and I think they would still love them for sure. And one of the things that I think is just, they, on paper, they should not be as good as they are, but I think mm. there's a few yeah. elements that came together which was, for one thing, the casting really worked well. Yeah. Um, you've got, I mean, so that role, the role of Kevin could be quite easily be annoying if, if just done by a different actor who's, like, not a lovable child yeah, actor, and he, you know? and, he, and he's, like, he's a little bit of a shit. Like, I mean, he at the is, beginning of the movie, like, he's, everybody he's hates like, Kevin. He's a likable shit. Well, that's the thing. Is it's <laughs> and like, and, and he's, he's sympathetic as well because you feel bad for him that all of his family members are like, you know what? You know when he like kind of screws things up and you know it's not actually his fault entirely, but the whole family is kind of against him? Kevin, like, you're such a disease. Yeah. And who <laughs> hasn't had the experience of, well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe some people don't, don't have the experience of feeling that way, but... um. If you grew up, especially probably in a big family, you probably had some sort of a moment where you felt like you were just, I don't know, the outcast of the family or the black sheep of the family or something where where you had some moment where people got angry at you and you had to pout off to your room and feel like shit. Yeah. I mean, I don't even think that is, I don't think that is so much that everybody was out to get him and everybody hated him. It's more that what was happening was that because he had like his older brother who's being an older brother and being a dick and everyone's kind of who I I love Buzz by the oh, way. Oh, Buzz is great. Buzz, I wish Buzz did more stuff Again, because I, he yeah, was I know. great in in that role <laughs> like just uh, just he's shoving like, that pizza in his mouth yeah. just to be a dick about he, he, it. He's and, another one of those hilarious asshole uh, characters, right? <laughs> yeah. Where where <laughs> Buzz, your girlfriend. <laughs> Woof. Yeah. Um, oh, did you know about that? that that's a boy. Yeah, I know yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Was like the, that the was actually very thoughtful. Yeah, because they were just like it would be too cruel to have a girl uh, to have it be an actual girl. So I, I yeah, actually appreciate yeah. that they they were thoughtful enough to I know, do that. Me too. I just think it's such a hilarious. Yeah. Because uh, if it was Easter a girl, egg. she would have gone down in history. She'd be like, yeah, like I was the I'm, ugly. I'm that ugly joke. In mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, but um but yeah no the thing with that movie it's just I think so many things just went well it was it was perfectly cast and then you've got the great writing of John Hughes the great directing of Chris Columbus and the great music of John Williams yes exactly all and, these things coming together and it just it ended up uh going perfectly the thing with and again like uh, so 
yeah, Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern together. Which, I'll just like so have such great. Do you know who chem- originally was supposed to be? Fuck, we were talking about this. Who? So it, it was Joe Pesci, wasn't it? It was but Joe there was Pesci. Not Daniel Stern. So Joe Pesci was would have been the Marv character. Wait, is is Daniel Stern Marv? Yeah, yeah. So Joe Pesci was supposed to be Marv. Robert De Niro was supposed to be Joe oh, Pesci, which man, wow. that yeah, would have right. it, it would have changed the tone. But it would have man, that would have been interesting too, though. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and so that it would have been um, Joe. So it would have been De Niro at the beginning of the movie in the cop uniform. Yeah, like, hey, yep, you yep. know, uh, we're yeah. just checking up on the houses, and yeah. and I could see it. It would be mm-hmm. different. It would almost be a little bit like. I feel like it'd be like a little bit like darker and scary here yeah, with probably. like De Niro and Pesci just would've. straight off of Goodfellas, you know? But Which um, I also like, again, I, I like, I think that that movie needed to sort of go a little bit dark for it to succeed a little bit. Because in mm-hmm. some ways there is a little bit of a darkness there. And the, well, there had to be some threat, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, this, this is another thing that I think works really well about the movie. It walks that fine line of making those villains... Um, imbeciles but still threatening right because yeah. in a lot of the sequels they're just straight out fl- friggin buffoons yeah, yeah and so you're like well this sucks this is a stupid movie mm-hmm. and these are stupid villains and <laughs> there's like it, it's good that the joe pesci character brings a little bit of competence to the table yeah. to kind of balance out the the total sort of imbecile that uh, that that uh, Daniel Stern's character is. Yeah. But again, they they just walk that line very well in that you can actually take them seriously, and that's something that they blow so they just completely blow it in other movies. Yeah. Apparently, Joe Pesci left a permanent scar <clears throat> on Macaulay's finger for the sequence when he's like when they catch oh. Kevin and they're like first thing I'm like we're gonna do to you everything <clears throat> you did to us but first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bite off these fingers yep. one by one <laughs> which in itself you're kind of like this is kind of intense <laughs> but apparently he was like so in character that he bit down hard enough that he actually like bit into Macaulay's finger oh, wow. like leaving like a scar at least that's what I, I I've heard uh, yeah. as like an urban legend and I, I could I wow. could believe I it like so from, bad <laughs> just imagine. I don't know if Joe Pesci did feel bad. I think he was yeah. just kind of like, yeah, yeah this fuck fucking that kid. I, I <laughs> oh, speaking of speaking of fucking fr- and shit. Fridge and fr- fridge and fridge, <laughs> fridge, fridge and fridge, 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 fridge. That's, that's what I thought was so funny was apparently um, it was like Joe Pesci kept on swearing in the yeah. middle of the movie. And they were like, OK, you, you can't say all these words. It's like a family film. You can't be <laughs> straight, dropping F-bombs the whole yeah. time. And so he just invented that whole kind of gibberish uh, yeah. dialogue to yeah, yeah, so yeah. that he could he could be kind of his classic character. Yeah. And it totally works. Oh, too. Totally. Again, yeah, like yeah. you know again, any adult kind of knows what he's getting at. Mm-hmm. But it still has the effect of a guy who's so pissed off that he's just cursing and swearing. Yeah, it's like he's like swearing under his breath or he's so angry it just yeah. doesn't come out, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. uh yeah, no, it's um also by the way, before we move on, I gotta just say some of my favorite sequences, because this is again something that they play into with both movies, is when Kevin's watching those um <clears throat> old classic film noir gangster oh, movies yeah, that are yeah. clearly recreations and stuff. <laughs> Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. Yeah. And uh, I would watch a full length, <laughs> I would watch full length versions of those well, movies. And I, was, they, con- I okay. was convinced that it was a real movie. Yeah, no, I had to like go and research it. I'm like, what is this movie? And then, so I think it's called Angels with Filthier Souls or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, oh man, it's so good. And again, how quotable are some of those lines in yeah, there? Like, yeah. <laughs> And then just the fact that they brought back that actor to just do it all over again for the, the mm-hmm. sequel movie. Like, mm-hmm. it was just... Uh, and j- for the same gag, too, right? Just to convince yeah, people that, yeah. like, you know, you're an adult in the, in the location. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, should we ma- should we move on to some other titles? Because we probably still have a lot yeah, to go yeah, here. Yeah, probably should. Um, um, I, thought, I thought I had a good segue from Home Alone into something else, but... Uh, should we maybe, I don't know, should we start with our, should we go down our lists at this well, point? Well, you know, I was I kind of thinking, it's yeah, we're, uh, just, we're just sort of bouncing around between different things. Uh, you know what, I will, I, I, I wouldn't mind talking about um, maybe uh, Jingle All the Way right jingle now. Jingle All the Way! Because that's, uh, ah. that's, that's also one of my favorite Christmas movies, and I think a must-see Christmas movie, and a total classic. Again, partially for the relatability factor of, like, that whole 
situation you're put in when you're you're trying to find the toy for your kid, but it's the most popular thing that everybody wants and every store is sold out, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I had encountered that. I remember when the movie Toy Story came out, I really wanted a Woody, a Woody doll. And they were oh, like that, sold okay. out everywhere. Like we just, we, we had the hardest time finding it at the time. Buzz Lightyear was, was going to be like, if you just waited actually. a few years, you'd get your Woody. But <laughs> okay, now I understand. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Different kind of Woody. <laughs> but, but yeah, no. Um, so there was that or else like, for instance, I think when some of the gaming consoles came out, like the GameCube or the Wii, especially was yeah. very hard to find. Um, and there's been a number of different toys like that over the years that kids have asked for and really wanted and it's like again the parents are trying so hard to get them i remember when i was working at uh, the source back in like 2008 uh the we was what everybody wanted and we had so many people come in asking if we had them in stock and it was like no no we don't have any and then we'd finally get one in stock and it would just be off the shelves in like an hour. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I would think that you guys would just try to have as many Wii's as you could. But uh, but I mean, yeah, even like smaller, simple. Isn't it simple funny that I was trying to get a Woody and then... It, <laughs> and you it, got it, a these, Wii. <laughs> That's uh, always the most popular toy. Yeah. Why is that? Um, but yeah, like, I mean, yeah, like, it's like every year there's, I don't know, maybe because we're so out of touch with the kids these days we, we, I, I can't really think of what like the cool toys would be now probably just cell phones <laughs> but back in the day there was yeah. like you know furbies was a thing for a while oh, uh, yeah, beanie yeah, yeah. babies yeah. Or, uh, sh- uh, tickle me elmo yeah yeah a little one? bit before our time like cabbage patch dolls went like crazy for oh, a yeah. year or two there so there's always yeah. like these things that just very briefly all of these parents are just um just just scouring stores to try to get their hands on one yeah yeah um and again, the Turbo Man doll in Jingle All the Way was such a good example of one because it was such a cool toy for one thing. And I'm you know, amazed I, that they didn't actually did the, like they should have released actual Turbo toys after I know, the movie. I know but, it's amazing that they didn't kind of right, yeah. but I guess like maybe just the merchandising wasn't it wasn't a strong enough concept for kids or yeah. something maybe. But but it did really remind me because they created all those those fake uh, TV show episodes for mm-hmm. the movie. Which worked great, but it reminded me a lot of Power Rangers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like this kind of retro it's superhero turbo time type of or thing. It, was that a th- yeah, did they yeah, say yeah. that in the movie? It's yeah. turbo time. Yeah. And uh, then they had like the shitty character booster that nobody wanted, so there was tons of them in stock. <laughs> and again, that's like just such a classic thing. Like you'll have a, a lineup of of action figures or something and there's one, you know, everybody usually wants the main character or one specific one and they sell out like crazy because they're so popular. But then there's all these other ones that nobody really wants. And so they're totally overstocked. Yeah. It's just such a funny way of depicting the whole merchandising industry and especially how that goes around the holidays. If there's one thing, and, that- and especially I think putting Arnold Schwarzenegger in that role is hilarious too. He's, and he's very underrated for his comedic acting. Yeah, um, just, just his diversity as an actor in general, right? For yeah. being like a great action guy, but also being hilarious in in comedy. And I, people really shit dramatic. on his act. B- back in the day, in the eighties and nineties, people really shit on Schwarzenegger as an actor. Um, but I think people. He's, I think now time has kind of like shown that, like looking back. Um, people now realize kind of how lucky and fortunate we were to have actually such a dynamic, charismatic action star who was much more than just an action guy. I mean, just just based on what people who've come to follow, like people like Dwayne Johnson and others, like can't capture the sort of magic that something like Schwarzenegger had, which... And he is so, he is so, so iconic too. He's he's such an icon. He's so identifiable and yet fits right into these roles really well. Yeah. Well, because I think he's genuinely, I think think he's a guy who genuinely uh, has, I'm not saying like he's a hilarious guy, but he's got enough sense of a humor that he's willing to make fun of himself. And Mm -hmm. he, he Mm -hmm. knows, um, he knows how to be funny in the right way for somebody like him, you know, where he's not going to be like a, a zany goofball kind of person, but he'll kind of play off of his, he kind of is really good at doing like the straight man kind of comedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't need a Schwarzenegger in jingle all the way. The only thing that really made it fitting to have Schwarzenegger is that once he dresses up as turbo man, it kind of 
makes sense. Yeah. But you could have had anyone in that role. It didn't have to be Schwarzenegger, yeah. but oh. Schwarzenegger's comedic timing is good enough that um, that it more than uh, works. And one thing I was going to just say about the movie that has always been a little bit bittersweet for me is whenever I see... Um, um, Phil Hartman. Phil Hartman. Because yeah. I, I I love Phil Hartman. I'm such a huge fan, and it's kind of one of his last movies, really, of his career. You know. When you were really starting to see him really kind of... Um, not find himself, because I think he had known, he knew what he was for a long time, but you were kind of like, oh man, like had he had lived, I would have seen, I would have seen that character in a lot more movies and probably more where he would have been starring and stuff. And so that's the only thing I get a little bit sad when I still see Phil Hartman. And yet he's, he's one of the best things about the movie. He I, is. I love oh him yeah. Him. He's such a great sort of counter character to Schwarzenegger because He's not like this hunk of a man, but yet he's he's the perfect man in all these other ways. Well, right? he's just sleazy and slimy enough to know that Schwarzenegger just, might need to be worried about. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I love how he's like he's so perfect as like this kind of bullshit family man. Like he's putting on the apron and he's baking cookies, and, but he's also Stop like eating so, my wife's cookies. But he's also so fake about like yeah. his his kindness and stuff. Yeah. And, Oh, he was just so per- like he's because he's so good at that kind of a character, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Again, kind of being like this two-faced person a little bit. Yeah. Uh, very manipulative or like ha- having bad, bad motivations and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, oh yeah, he was great. Um, even like Sinbad in in the movie was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. Um I remember kind of like, you know, Sinbad was popping up in a bunch of movies in the 90s and part of me was Mm -hmm. kind of like, "Ah, Sinbad's kind of annoying. But I was like, you know what, to be honest, like... In that one, he works? Yeah, it it worked. Like, he he, he does a great job. It's... it was an interesting choice, like mm-hmm. as far as kind of Schwarzenegger's foe, but he's got the right energy. Uh, and yet he's also actually kind of a bit like, like, you're not like, fuck Sinbad. You're kind of like, oh, you know yeah. what? Sinbad's got his own reasons for the doll too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just love that scene where he like pretends that he's got an explosive device. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like that, co- <laughs> the cop there is like... So, so he pretends he's got the explosive device and then manages to, like, get away from the cops. And then that guy comes up and he's like, I used to work in the bomb squad. And fellas, we got a dud here. Totally fake. And then he rips the thing open and then, it, again, it just, like, blows up in his face. And it's the classic, like, all right, you know, black uh, ashes on your face and your hair is all standing on end. But, yeah, it's, um again, it's a gag that was actually hilarious, not just super lame which those kind of cartoony gags can be mm-hmm. sort of just retarded sometimes. Um, but yeah, so many things worked about that movie. Um, going back to the Phil Hartman thing, yeah, like, again, it's when you watch it and you know that he was murdered by his wife, it's just sort of, sort of a darkness that lingers there as well, you know? And it was just shortly yeah. after that movie too, I think. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't too much. I, I don't think it was his last film that he made, but again, like it was, yeah, like I, I don't think it was more than like maybe a year or two after that. Cause I, I, I from what I, mm-hmm. I remember it pretty distinctly. I mean, cause I remember Chris Farley and Phil Hartman, they died just like, I think a few months from each other. And mm-hmm. I think it was both kind of in like, I kind of want to say like sort of like the winter of like 2000 or sorry, the winter of like 1997 mm-hmm. around that kind of okay. period. Sounds and and I think Jingle All the Way came out in like 96 Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it was pretty close and, uh, yeah, he was just such a talented guy. It was just a shame, uh, that we weren't able to just, see. I don't know. It's just unlike yeah. other things. I mean, I don't know. He, he, as, as sad as Chris Farley's death is like, I, I don't know. There's just comparing like a drug overdose to like a murder slash suicide by your own family member is it, just, uh, pretty intense. It is. It is. It totally is. Um, didn't you say that you watched Small Soldiers recently? Because he was in that, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, playing a very similar sort of character mm-hmm. in that he's like this. Yeah, which is, again, that's another perfect example of there's a little bit of melancholy watching Small Soldiers for the yeah. Hartman stuff. And that would have been even closer to when he died, actually, because yeah. that was a later movie. Yeah, that one actually might be his last movie. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Um, um, speaking of other movies that I guess you said you've seen more recently... Uh, I don't think you saw it this year, but maybe in the last few years, you were talking about how you saw Scrooged for the first time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was like, again, a staple at our house. Like we, 
uh, had it on tape and just watched it uh, constantly. Like even if it wasn't in the winter time, we would just sometimes be like, "Ah, oh, fuck it, we'll we'll throw on Scrooge." But um, that's probably the Scrooge movie I've seen more than any other like sort of Christmas. It's not like the most traditional Christmas Carol movie, but of a movie that has like Scrooge, a Scrooge like character and that whole premise. I think that's the one I've seen mm-hmm. the most. Yeah. Well, and so what it is is basically it's like the Christmas Carol story, but set in this TV producer world, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a bit meta because it's about a TV producer who's producing a Christmas Carol TV mm-hmm. special. Right, right. Um, but then it goes to the whole tropes of, you know, he goes through his own visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's like the modern Bill Murray version of A Christmas Carol, really. Yeah. And it's a little bit maybe funnier than yeah. other ones. It was a nice twist on that story, actually, as far as doing that kind of modern adaptation of a classic, classic story yeah, type of thing. Directed by Richard Donner, fresh ah, off of The Goonies. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. It's just, it's... I guess the thing was, again, it's a classic movie that I saw as a kid and I just, I wasn't really laughing at it as a kid. I just enjoyed it. And then as I get older, I keep discovering jokes that I yeah. didn't get as a kid. Well, that's the way some of these are, though, too, is they're not necessarily laugh out loud knee slappers, but they're just entertaining in kind of a way that's funny and you're just kind of sucked into them and, and glued to the TV watching them. And, and they're funny, but... You know, again, you're sort of laughing on the inside maybe at times. Well, it's great. It's great watching Bill Murray be an asshole because he's an asshole in most of his movies. Like most of his characters are assholes. (laughs) But I don't know if he's more of an asshole than he is in Scrooge. Right. Which kind of makes sense. I mean, he's supposed to like that is the nature of that character. mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just, you know, unabashed, full blown, just I'm a dick Bill Murray. Uh, Aside from maybe some of like the flashback moments. But... If you're kind of a fan of the sort of like asshole humor, like it's fucking great. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also love the way they go about the ghost. Like it's just, it was very original the way they went about like in particular, the ghost of Christmas past and Christmas present. Um, ghost of Christmas future is your sort of typical kind of grim reaper type. But, uh, but the other two, I was just sort of like, Oh, that's such like a neat spin. You know, you got the, uh, I forget his name, but like the lead singer of the New York Dolls playing the taxi driver ghost. And then you get Carol Kane playing this like fairy nymph kind of character. And um, I don't know, just like a very original kind of like take on it all. And just very iconic. Like I just, you know, I see those images and I just instantly am like, yep, that's Scrooged. Um, yeah, I've only seen it once. And again, it was a couple of years ago now, or maybe it was actually last year. Yeah. But yeah, totally enjoyed it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'll probably watch it <clears throat> more and more in subsequent years since... One of the early I, Danny Elfman soundtracks, actually. Oh, he did the score he for that? He did the score, yeah. Oh, it was... Shit. uh he, he At this point, he had, he had definitely started working with uh, Tim Burton, but this would yeah, have been Yeah, this pre- was in the 80s, though, Yeah, wasn't this it? would have been pre-Batman... Right. Maybe right. even pre Beetlejuice. <clears throat> so this was kind okay, of his wow. first. This was the first Danny Elfman movie where he really um, played with those Christmas themes that he became really famous for. Yeah. But this was that first one that you kind of have those like la 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 la, la and you're just like, yep, he like he was born to do Christmas music. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Christmas and Halloween music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think that movie also might have been my introduction to Bobcat Goldthwait. You know? Oh, okay, okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, Karen Allen, you know, uh, who we all know from, you know, I guess Animal House and more so Indiana Jones. You know, yeah. she's uh, great in the movie. I just always have found her very likable. And um, I don't know. It's like overall it's just really got a Christmas feel to it. I don't yeah. know. And that's, I guess, the main thing well, I'm looking for when I'm watching these Christmas movies mm-hmm. is, is like like not just other a couple of scenes that feel Christmassy. It's like just the whole movie feels exactly festive. Yeah. It was sort of like I started watching, um, oh, what's that Matthew Perry movie? Um, the one that has like Selma Hayek. Um, it's, it's a classic rom-com. 
Oh, Fools Rush In. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And that one starts out very Christmassy, right? It doesn't end up being... And so when I started watching it, I was like, oh, I didn't even realize this was a Christmas movie. But very Christmassy. And I was like, oh, great. I'm going to get to see a Christmas movie right now. This is great. And then it goes off and it doesn't end up being all that Christmassy at all. But yeah. uh, but I do like ones when... And it, again, this is probably what makes something kind of more solidified as a Christmas movie is when the full thing actually gives you those those feelings, right? And it takes mm-hmm. place in winter and around the season. Because if it's one that goes off and veers off into other uh, time periods, other seasons and stuff, and... yeah. Then I'm not going to sit through the four minutes of Goodfellas that's Christmassy and be like, that's a Christmas <laughs> yeah. movie. I know, I know. But at the same time, it in some ways kind of feels like one to me. But I, but well, that, definitely that's during a, that's the Christmas actually, moment, yeah. Exactly. But that, that's actually a great <laughs> example of what I'm talking about. The yeah, yeah. Perfect example. I think um, the other thing, too, with Scrooge is there's been so many friggin' adaptations of A Christmas Carol over the years. Uh, we were talking earlier, there's probably like one in every decade at least. Yeah. And it's like that's a that was a nice fresh take on it, right? Because otherwise they they keep on repeating themselves so often. There's there's a lot and I need to see. Have you like watched I haven't seen all of them. Yeah. But I've seen at least let's see, I've seen a black and white one from I don't know exactly when that was. Probably That might the, be like the real classic one I'm thinking, unless there's a few uh it, older ones, but Yeah. Uh, I got to check and find out when that one was from. But I've seen obviously uh I've seen a Muppets Christmas Carol, mm-hmm. which is yeah. maybe my favorite one. There's the um, <laughs> the Robert Zemeckis Jim Carrey one. I, I actually really like that one too, yeah. largely just because it's so beautiful to look at. To yeah. me, like I love yeah. that CG yeah. environment yeah. that they, and and it's it's also very um, that that was done with the intention, I think, of being fairly close to the novel. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like uh, at least somewhat. Yeah, I'm sure there was some small liberties, but yeah, it, it they seems... go off and have some some action sequences yeah. in there and stuff that make it. a little... Did you ever see the old like Disney TV? Spe- you know, with Scrooge McDuck, like the old classic Disney uh, oh, Christmas way, Carol. Way back in the day, yeah. yeah. So that's another animated example. Hey. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, there was. I never saw it, but there's. Uh, I guess it's regarded as oh. one of the better ones, which is. I think it's a George C. Scott Scrooge. I was uh, gonna say, yeah. There's one with him, and is there also one maybe with like Patrick Stewart? Oh, there is. Yeah, 1999. Yeah, Patrick Stewart was in that one. Uh, 1984 was the Christmas Carol with George C. Scott, which I haven't seen either of those. Yeah, so. but they both seem like um, they would. Both of those guys, I think, would make great uh, Scrooges. Yeah. Okay. The one that I saw was from 1938. Reginald Owen. Yeah, that sounds like the classic. Uh, that sounds like the classic original. Wait, I mean, unless there was a, there might have been a silent Christmas Carol, but that seems like the first yeah. real uh, legit one. Pretty sure this is the one that I saw. And then there's a 1951 Scrooge movie. Oh, okay. Uh, yep. 2004 with Kelsey Grammer. Oh. Huh. Like there's yeah, just now, now so it feels many. like now it feels like, like every I'm five just, years they I'm come just out with a new one. Scrolling down the list, there's one from '71. There's one yeah. from 2001. Got a little public domain animated. stories. <laughs> well, that's that's just it, right? I imagine that's yeah. But I think we can both agree, um, at least what we had on our list. We uh, this may be a good segue to say, you know, we're both quite fond of the Muppet Christmas Carol. That yeah, was yeah. that might have been. I saw that in theaters when it first came out, and. I was definitely very well aware of the Muppets. I had watched a lot of the show, but I think that might have been my first Muppet movie maybe that I saw. And so that was always special to me about it. There's something, I I don't know, I really enjoy the first Muppet movie, but there's something about a Muppet Christmas Carol that seems very special. And I think it probably has to do with the fact that it was it was the last Muppet movie <clears throat> where Jim Henson was alive to at least give his seal of approval. But uh, I think he died. He died early in the production. So there was this real oh. kind of tribute to Jim that was ki- yeah. that's kind of felt during the movie. Kind of like, let's really do this right. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so there's something about that that just makes it kind of stand out a bit over some of the other Muppet movies. I find. Uh, not that the other ones aren't great, but yeah, there's something about the Christmas Carol one where they were like, this is a tribute to Jim. Let's really, mm-hmm. let's make sure that we don't fuck this one up. Yeah. And I just find that sense of humor that they get at in the Muppet movies to be so, I don't know, bizarrely 
strange and funny. Yeah, well, they're they're genuinely funny guys. Like, there's if you yeah, ever have yeah. a chance but to it's watch, also, it's it's so hilarious to like put these 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 puppet creatures that are totally like these you know cartoon puppets in contact with actual dramatic actors. Because one of the things people often say is like how seriously Michael Caine takes the role when he plays Scrooge. Yeah, and and was, I actually really love him th- as Scrooge, too. And that was always intentional. He was like, I'm going to play this movie as if <clears throat> I am in a legitimate live-action Scrooge. Like, he, he, was, like, he, he was like, he I'll play engages, this exactly the way I would have. And, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and he, 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 just, he, just, he, he engages with these puppets as, as if they were real people. Yeah. And I don't know, there's something funny about that, but it also sells it more. Yeah. And you kind of get more into it that way like he doesn't ham it up a whole lot no it's it's the best thing he you know he could have done because again obviously Mm -hmm. the script was written in a way that they're not going to make him do anything overly intense or creepy it's like so it's just uh and it was also maybe in some ways it was also probably easier it's like for him to play it the way he would any other way it's like why why would i change why would i give this bogus goofy performance yeah uh when i can just you know he, like he was probably like this might be my only opportunity to ever play Scrooge. Yeah. So yeah. why not do it just as if I would do it any other way? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's one of the real. Weirdly enough, Michael Caine is the highlight of a Muppet <laughs> Christmas Carol. As much as I love the Muppets, yeah, yeah. he's really the core of what makes that movie work. Because it's weird, like all pretty much every other Muppet movie is a Muppet movie. Like the Muppets are the stars. But the Muppets are all there to support Michael Caine right, in the Christmas right. Carol, yeah, yeah, which is kind of different. It's a observation. Yeah. And I also like, I mean, so it's a musical too. So they bring all these little musical numbers. I don't know how you feel about the musical element of well, it, but it, I kind of like these songs that come up. And I think that was a tradition. I think, in, I think in pretty much all the Muppet movies are musicals right. to some degree. That's what I was going to yeah. say too, is that, it, it, you know, that's like their shtick. That's what they do. But it's a nice addition to that story like I like I like having it there yeah well and they're good so- like that's the thing is with me like I'm not crazy about musicals but if they're at least really good songs that certainly helps a lot usually yeah. if I don't like a musical it's just that I hate the songs right but right. um and I mean I'm trying I'll be honest the main one that really that I'm there's only kind of like two that I can kind of really remember off the top of my head. And that's kind of like the intro to screw like here comes Mr. Humbug yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that one. and then there's um and then there's that song that's sung by um uh, the ghost of Christmas present yeah. who, who's who got like a tune and I'm sure there's a few others. Well, there's the one that's like, we are Harley and Marley. Oh, right, those two, right, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Those two, the two old dudes who yeah, I love. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well, something in Waldorf. Good. Yeah. Um, there was the, tis the season to be jolly and joyous. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's right, a great right. one. What's that one where it's like, he's almost, Kermit's just kind of almost like scatting. Like with his like with Tiny Tim on his shoulder, and he's just like boopy doop boop I, There's like oh, there's like no yeah, real lyrics remember. to it, but they're just like walking down the London streets to go home, and they're just kind of like freestyling it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, yeah, no, like there was nothing in it that uh, like also it didn't seem like there was tons of songs, and that's I think another thing yeah, I really like yeah. in musicals is when there's like a small healthy dose of maybe like four songs. Well, that's just it, right? Because like a true pure musical is like the whole thing is sung basically. Yeah, that's when, when I want to like blow musical- my out. <laughs> right, 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 like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that too. I've kind of found an appreciation for some of those. Like obviously, I love Sweeney Todd, and that's pretty much a total full musical. But mm-hmm. um, but. I think it is definitely more tolerable to watch one that's that just has them intermittently spur, uh, dispersed throughout the. Yeah, well, the I feel story. like it's more of a gravitas too when they do. It's like, oh, we're going into a song yeah, now, you as kind opposed of like draw attention to this moment, this yeah. dramatic, uh, this dramatic moment that's taking place. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I don't know. But yeah, have you seen any of the of the other Christmas Carol versions yourself, or the mainly? So yeah, the one, only ones I can really think of that really stand out are the Robert Zemeckis CGI one, the Bill Murray Scrooged. Uh, I think I watched another animated one in the seventies by Richard Williams, who okay. he famously was the animator animation director for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, mm-hmm. um, and it was okay. I guess the problem with me is it's like. You know, after a certain point, you're like, 
I know the story. <laughs> yeah. You're not really going to surprise me with it. It's really just like, okay, is there anything you're doing differently with it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like that's partly why I'm not super anxious to jump into, you know, say like the old thirties one that you saw or the well, George maybe, C. Scott, just cause I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I yeah, know the fair. story, but maybe, maybe uh, what we could segue in is from the Robert Zemeckis Christmas Carol to a movie that I love. And I don't think you like it that much, but okay. um, the Polar Express, mm. which I, so the thing that I really love about the Polar Express is now it's sort of in that, those earlier days of, um, CGI where, it wasn't quite as uh, you the know, uncanny it, valley yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. It, it certainly wasn't as as advanced and well done as it was when they got to the Christmas Carol or beyond. But to me, it still really captures this like magical vibe. And again, it has these elements of kind of melancholy, loneliness, a little bit of darkness around the the um, hall. Uh, maybe maybe darkness isn't the right word but sort of a sense of mystery and magical elements it, that um, ha- it had to it, have been a children's book right yeah it yeah, just it started yeah. as a children's book and and i think that maybe it's it's partially just the magic of riding a train through the winter because usually i have this uh like usually when i go home for the holidays i i take the via rail on this overnight journey through the mountains and um i don't know it's this very this very beautiful kind of atmosphere when you're when you're on that trip and people are sleeping in their chairs and all the lights are out and you go up into the bubble car and you can look out especially when you're going to the Fraser Valley if like the moon is lit up and it's snowy wow it is just completely magical and there's something about that that resonates with me a lot where it it really takes me on that that journey where it's it feels so much like a dream and yet it's yeah it's kind of this Again, a, a childhood fantasy, I suppose, which is very yeah. true to the the spirit of of Christmas. I think. Yeah, I like the uh, I like the premise, and I even like <clears throat> the visuals, at least as far as like the set pieces, like the, the sort of like the land, like this landscape shots, like the stuff with the trains. It's for me, it's just it's the it's the characters themselves, the design of the characters, ah. their dead soulless eyes <laughs> that that's the only real thing the that, thing um, that. I'm just sort of like, fuck, if only this movie just came out four years later around that period where Zemeckis did Beowulf, then mm-hmm. I almost think everything would have been maybe perfect. Well, it would have made it a lot better. Yeah. It would have taken it to that, to that level. Hey, it's almost like a movie that deserves to be remade in the exact same way but just like upgrading the graphics kind of the way yeah. that you'll do like a video game it's like it needs some like computer nerd kid to like not even like re- <laughs> like not to remake it but just like literally to like yeah. paint over the frames and like, like almost like, or, or you know what i almost wonder it. if like deep faking would be enough just like somehow like can you like deep fake <clears> those <throat> faces to make them a little bit more uh, I don't know, lifelike yeah. or something like I, I saw something like that. They did this with the uh, the li- the live action Lion King movie, oh, where okay. somebody deep faked the animated characters' faces wow, onto weird. the live action animal characters, and you ended up getting much more of this um, so hybrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, 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 of being of, realistic, but also cartoony. Well, or yeah, still human, containing the, the the those cartoony elements while yeah. in a more realistic world. And wow, I'm like, that uh, interesting. I'm like, oh, it'd be nice if you could kind of do that um, with you know, just like the Tom Hanks character and the yeah, boy. Yeah, just to enhance just, it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, just like little small things because I don't think it would take much. Yeah, I don't um, know. I wonder what that process would be like because I do understand what you're saying. Like the the animated characters can seem a little bit like dull and lifeless um to me i was just always kind of able to look past that and that didn't bother me so much i, I love i was also like 17 when the movie came out so i was like yeah, you know yeah. kind of smoking weed and being like fuck this <laughs> what the hell is this bullshit <laughs> i actually uh, didn't watch it until i was i guess i was 18 when i watched it funny and funnily enough i think i watched it around like valentine's day 2008 <laughs> oh, okay and and um and so it was a number of years after it had come out. Yeah, that's right, because I got it at like a $5 bin at Walmart or whatever and just took it home and watched yeah. it. And it took me on like this magical ride. And I was like, I'm going to watch this every Christmas from now on. But uh, I, I love the environments. I love the lighting. And even even a lot of the character dynamics. Okay, I'll, I'll mention a few things. 
kind of the, the character dynamics, the, the theme of the movie of like, you know, it's largely about uh, this kid. He, he's a kid who kind of is growing up too fast, you might say, and he's losing his belief in Santa. And, you know, this is, again, a very relatable thing. It's like you're kind of, you start processing uh, logically uh, this myth that you've been told your whole life, right? And you're like, you know what? I, I think the wool's been pulled over my eyes. Santa Claus doesn't exist. It's all bullshit. And because none of this makes any sense logically. And so that's where that character is coming from. And then he gets taken off on this uh, on this journey and this adventure. And, you know, the, the thing that he learns essentially is like to believe in in things that aren't real don't, don't exist <laughs> kind of but there's, well, there's, a, great there's a little bit there's, there's a bit of a philosophy I, I think that it's it's maybe a little bit it, it has a, a, a message of um kind of the value of faith i suppose or, or believing in the impossible maybe yeah, it's, it's actually it's a classic trope i think in a lot mm. of Christmas movies, yeah, whether it's yeah, a kid yeah, yeah. or sometimes they even make that role with the adult. Um, right. I mean, even Scrooge in, in the, that, that Scrooge premise, right. Where it's like someone's kind of lost their faith or belief in, 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 you know, in magic or, or fun or whatever Christmas. Yeah. And they've and like turned they, into like a skeptic or a, or a cynic, I guess yeah. would be the better word. But then they, they somehow remember a time, a simpler time when they did believe mm-hmm. in something. Um, I mean, I don't know, that almost kind of saves me too. I wasn't even sure if I was going to bring this one up. Uh, Like, it wasn't really one that was going to maybe make my list, but it's just because it's that movie I saw just the other night, which was, uh, it was that one that gave me a lot of closure because this was a movie that I just remembered was being on, it was on TV for years, um, but it always seemed like weird to me because I would watch it in chunks. And so this is the one called um, One Magic Christmas. Oh, okay, okay. Well, let's, okay. Oh, do you want to mention that? I'm just going to mention one more thing about um, Polar Express. Polar Express before we move on. I think it's another great example of where the music makes the movie more um, magical. It's got a really good score by uh, Alan Silvestri. And I don't know if you're if you remember the music from it at all. I, but I don't. Some... I do know Al, Al, Alan Silvestri. Silvestri. Uh, I, for some reason, I, did, was this a fever dream or does Aerosmith pop up at the end of the movie? Because I don't yeah, know why yeah. I feel like <laughs> that happened. That was a weird cameo. But yes, um, uh, uh, Steven Tyler performs uh, the song like Santa Claus is yeah. coming to town. And if you think something. Tom Hanks is terrifying in uh, early CGI, <laughs> yeah. just uh, look at uh, Steven Tyler. Well, and yeah. so there there are a few things like that that I that kind <laughs> of diminish the movie for me, like that, in just that there's maybe some bad childish moments, or there's like some weird things that happen which are not so cool. But but uh, yeah, by and large, I think it's quite a strong movie and I tend to look over those things that don't sit as well with me. And yeah, I think that the score is absolutely fantastic, but it's maybe gets a little bit repetitive. You know how John Williams usually will bring a lot of themes to a movie and they're all great and they all kind of impact you in different ways. I do find that the music in Polar Express has got some great themes, but they do get a little bit repetitive and overused as the movie goes on. But anyway, mm-hmm. great, great music. Otherwise, so coming back to the one you were just about to talk to, a Christmas wish you said. Well, one one magic Christmas, I think oh, it's called. Oh, one magic Christmas. Um, yeah. And it was just I don't know, maybe maybe some of our older listeners might remember this one. This one came out in like the mid '80s, and I just remembered <clears throat> it was always on TV, and it always just weirded me out. Like, because again, it was kind of an adult. <laughs> it's weird. It's like it's it's a I guess it's a family Christmas movie, but there's such heavy themes in this movie that the marketing just did not seem very appealing when I was a kid. Mm. Um, for one thing, Harry Dean Stanton keeps popping up as this angel who's in like a trench coat and fedora and he's like up in a tree playing a harmonica and I'm just like, what the, f- who's this guy? He just seemed like kind of mysterious and scary more than than like an angel. Um and then there's like this whole um, premise where Mary Steenburgen, the mom, who she's like the Scrooge in the movie, and she's such a sweet actress that she can't even play 
like a bitch. Like even when she's at her like, <laughs> like, yeah. like most scroogiest, you're still like, this is clearly like the sweetest lady that ever existed, but she's just like living in hard times. And she's just, you know, she's just like, well, Santa Claus isn't real and just we're poor and everything's kind of turning to shit. Um, long story short in the movie, her husband gets murdered and her children die. And, <laughs> So it's just kind of that like, oh, we need to make wow. her believe in Christmas. Well, let's just take everything away from her, even though she's already like, like up shit creek. Yeah. Um, so as a kid, I'm just sort of like, whoa, what? Like, is this movie like I want to like watch? Like, I didn't even know really like that the kids like die, but it's like a guy robs a bank and he like steals her car and the kids are inside and he crashes the car and it goes over a bridge. Oh, and it's wow. like your husband and your kids are all dead on Christmas kids. Eve. <laughs> Disney, everybody. Like Disney in the tragedy. 80s. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I always like saw this more as like a drama yeah. as opposed to a kid's movie. You think. You're but then I, me about it and I'm like, Yeah. Wow. But then I watched it and I was just sort of like, oh, this is actually like quite wholesome and feel good. Like I, I was a good age by the time I watched it. I don't know. As a kid, I would have just been a little bit too like maybe it would have been a little bit ma too mature for like a little kid to see, uh, which is weird because I bet a lot of kids did watch this movie simply because it was a Disney Christmas film. Um has the uh, acting debut of Sarah Pauly. Uh, if you're hmm. familiar much with her, she's kind of a, kind of like a Canadian uh, legend in the industry, but uh, this was like her first movie. She actually okay. just, she what? won the Oscar for best director recently <clears throat> for little women, Oh, but uh, she was in a lot what? of, Cana she was a Canadian actress uh, for a long time. She didn't direct little women. Oh, sorry. Not little women. Uh, sorry. That was Greta Gerwig. Uh, no, mm -hmm. she did this other movie though. Uh, that, that uh, one best, director oh is it like the it, it's like a, it's, the it's, dog it's, or whatever the no i don't i don't think she did that one it's a very female-based movie that's why i confused it with little women uh, it, it's a very f female heavy Sarah story Pauly. yeah she was in um she's in she's in tons of canadian stuff she she starred on the show road to avonlea she did a lot of movies with adam agoy oh, okay, and she, okay. she's kind of this real uh, she's a very respected actress in the canadian um in the canadian scene she's hmm. been around for a long time uh now she's more or less doing um <clears throat> directing she didn't really i i think almost had a choice she kind of chose not to really break into oh, hollywood women talking there you go that's the movie um, she's the lead in the Dawn of the Dead remake. Like the stuff that people really know her from are probably not the movies that she is. They're probably not yeah. her absolute best movies. Gotcha. But I do recognize her a little bit. Yeah. Vaguely here. Um, but, uh, but anyways, yeah, no, it was a, it was a decent movie. Uh, it became much more fantasy based than I realized. Like Santa Claus actually does show up in the movie. Oh, and okay. so there's, there's a whole, there really is a whole element of the mom, Re, uh, so you were saying her faith this movie was her acting debut, Sarah Pauly's. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 She's got a small. So when was the movie it, made then? Uh, Nineteen eighty-five. It came out. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's. Uh, I guess I, I don't know if I would have brought it up if I hadn't seen it so recently, but I just had a lot of closure from finally like watching this thing that I'd always seen in like little small pieces. Yeah, it's and whenever, nice when you do that. And yeah. whenever I saw the small sequences, they were always like the intense dramatic sequences. Because <laughs> um, needless to say, some Christmas miracles happen and everything all good happens at the end. They're not going to go insanely dark with the Disney stuff, even though it was that It's hard to imagine era. getting there from what she went through. Like... I'm trying to picture how it went from her children and husband being murdered to ending on a positive note. <laughs> well, that's where the Christmas miracle elements come in. Ah, yeah. yeah. That's the magic of Christmas. Let's just say everything basically is okay by the end. <laughs> um, but yeah, you don't know that as a kid when like they're marketing it being on like like it's just this woman like just freaking out like after her husband's been like shot she's just like where are my kids they he stole my kids he stole my kids and like watch the disney christmas classic this year guys and uh so i was just sort of like oh this just seems like a depressing uh shit fest of a movie um but no it's 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 very wholesome and uh yeah i don't know i i, I couldn't see this sort of movie being made today but um <clears throat> But yeah, I don't know. It, it, I felt it held up pretty well for like a 40 year old movie. So um, I always kind of thought of it as like a TV movie, but apparently it was a legit uh, theatrical film. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's nice to hear. It kind of does make me want to watch it anyway. Do you, d does any of it uh, sound because I, I could have sworn that like you would have still been of 
of a right age that this would have been airing on TV when you were a kid, but I don't know well, if any of this sounds I familiar. I feel like I would have seen the box at the video store. Mm. It seems seems like. I don't know. I mean, I definitely haven't watched the movie, though. Yeah. So Now, how do we segue from A Christmas Wish? Um, well, <clears throat> yeah, okay. So maybe what we should do is just talk about uh, our top five the five Christmas big ones movies then i mean I, I like many of the ones that we've talked about were on my top five so mm -hmm. it's good that we talked about them already yeah but um i'm just thinking of uh one that i wanted to mention was <clears throat> the family man okay did you ever watch that movie no i mainly just know it for the cake sequence oh fuck i hate the cake sequence. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's all so i know disgusting. about it yeah like, but wait, do, do you know no. it as the meme or do you only know it as the scene in the movie because oh, it's, it's the become movie. like the most kind of like referenced element of the movie as far as i'm concerned really yeah um like i think it got like somebody like reanimated the sequence so you can see like an animated Nicolas Cage just being like hey where's my cake I want my cake and like they remixed it into a song and that's what I know that's my main uh, reference to the family uh, family man okay um, I do remember the trailer I when it came seen, out I haven't seen the the gif thing or whatever the meme I haven't seen that do, do you remember when the trailer came out because that kind of made the movie sort of appealing to me. It was I all... seem to recall the trailer being on a video cassette that I had. Maybe it was like... Rick, I don't know. I like remember... The of Men in Black or Mask of Zorro or something like well, that. Well, they were using that famous Talking Heads song that actually oh. was like very um, appropriate based, I guess, on like the premise of the movie. I'm a family man. <laughs> that one? <laughs> no, no, no. It's just sort of like... Um, uh, how does it go? It, it, it's the, it's the one where uh, oh, this is not my this beautiful is not my wife. beautiful wife. This, this is, is not, not my beautiful, beautiful home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did I get here? And yeah, the yeah, days yeah. go by. So I was yeah, just sort of like, oh, like is, I'm like, did somebody base a movie <laughs> off the Talking Heads song? Is <laughs> that what this whole so. thing's about? But uh, um, but yeah, no, I, I is so is the movie pretty like Christmassy as a whole? Or yeah, I, I would say so. It's pretty legit. I mean, was it like a Christmas miracle it, that creates the whole? Uh, well, time uh, timeline uh, yeah, fuck, I'm break. To I, guess. I actually haven't seen it many times. I think I only watched it in its entirety for the first time last year, maybe. Yeah, last year around Christmas time. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's got a pretty strong holiday sort of theme. It might be sort of some Christmas magic. I, I'm not familiar enough. Well, the premise is it's a guy who exactly. gets to like relive his life as if he chose to be a family man instead of the yeah, businessman he is. Which is a right? fun, so. fun concept. Um, it's it's actually a little bit like um, It's a Wonderful Life in that way. Yeah. Hey, why don't yeah. we segue into It's a Wonderful Life for a moment? Because sure. Yeah, that's like the that's one of the big classic ones. Like that's... Do you watch It's a Wonderful Life every year or did no, you used to with your family? I or? only I only actually watched that one for the first time a couple of years ago as oh, well. Damn. So I've been sort of catching up on some of these, but I thought it was a really good movie and I wasn't yeah. expecting it to have that sort of fantasy element to it. But I always or the I don't know, imaginative element, I guess you would say. Yeah. But I always like it when movies do that. I think that's what often makes a story more interesting is does it bring some imagination to mm -hmm. the table or is it just going to be a movie that is like regular people living in the real world kind of doing normal things, you know? Well, what's neat is uh, the fantasy element of that movie is like, <clears throat> it's such a small percentage of the movie, and yet it's a very important element of the movie. But as you start watching the movie uh, more and more, and you're just getting more and more into George Bailey's life story, um, when it gets back into the fantasy element, you actually forget that there even ever was a fantasy element to begin with, right, kind yeah, of. And you're yeah. like, oh, right, there's a fucking angel in this movie. Yeah. Now, what and, is it that uh, he does? He, like, he shows him what the world would be like if he had died, basically, right? Well, is there's a part kind of where, basically, what happens is, is after... So, George Bailey's about to commit suicide, and then <clears throat> the angel jumps over the bridge instead... So that he ends up, so that he saves the angel instead yeah, of committing right. suicide. And then afterwards right. they're drying off and he, you know, he says like, oh, I, I, sometimes I just wish I was never born. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, oh, really? Well, why don't we show you what would, uh, like, cause I think he yeah, even says, yeah. he's, he's like, oh, everyone would just be better off if I was never born. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, would yeah, you? Yeah. Well, uh, 
let's just uh, see what that would actually be like, you mm-hmm. know, and then mm-hmm. everything's way more shit. And so, yeah, yeah. It's, again, it's like it's that's kind of that Scrooge element where he he um, realizes an alternate reality yeah, kind of, thing. Of, of how important he is to everybody and how he's like very useful and important. Yeah. And then and then even after all of that, like all of the friends and family come out to help this guy who's been nothing but selfless his whole life to help everybody else. And they come and help him. And it's mm-hmm. and it's yeah, like it's just a real emotional tear jerking kind of like ending and it's not yeah. it's sentimental but not that has like this real depressing aspect of it for a lot of the movie but then it turns out to be this very heartwarming finish that it arrives yeah. at you know I mean, it comes around to be I actually it. think most of the movie is actually fairly heartwarming but then it becomes Right, depressing, right. Yeah, but then gonna... it comes back at the end <clears throat> with, with with the and even like the end like the the, the happy ending isn't even like Oh shit! We hit the big times. It's just sort of like, no, my yeah, th- my friends were able to help out, so we weren't completely fucked, you right. know. <laughs> and uh, um, but it's it, it is very heartwarming though compared to what and then this is probably like actually a principle of filmmaking is that you experience the story uh, sort of relative to what else has gone on, right? So yeah. if you go to a dark place dramatically, then when you go to a brighter place later like sort of the the relative experience that you have makes it that much more um dramatic that much more substantial it's like you 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 show this this real low that a character gets to but that makes it more impactful when you go to the high place you know what i mean oh yeah absolutely right <clears throat> um experiencing it in in relation to each other did you ever see any other frank capra movies that this was my intro oh, to yeah, frank, frank capra. capra that's right it was a frank capra movie yeah i mean i'd say what it's else his, has he done that what i would would have been arsenic and old lace um uh, um oh there's another famous one from the 30s it's like the first screwball comedy and it won all <clears> the oscars um Okay, I'm not going to remember the title of that. He did uh, uh, Meet John Doe. Um, uh, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Um, I Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he could have had a whole series going on there. Yeah, well, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington was supposed to be a sequel to Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Okay, then makes sense. I, have, I haven't seen them, but I have, I've heard of... I'll be honest. I don't think I've seen a bad Frank Capra film. Nice. Uh, they're 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 more. surprisingly entertaining for how old they are. But I, yeah. it's a wonderful life is probably my favorite. It's it's the real classic one. It's the one that mm-hmm. he'll probably be most remembered for. Well, you used um, to say that this was at a time your favorite movie. Period. Hey? N- it was never my favorite movie, but there was a period where it was in my top ten. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it still is. I don't. I don't really believe that much in <clears throat> overall top tens anymore but um but yeah it's it's like i'm a really big jimmy stewart fan yeah. and uh it's kind of a perfect movie like i'm trying to think if there's any that's usually the way i kind of go about when i try to think about like really good movies as i sometimes it's easier to just think like well does it have any flaws and mm-hmm. um there's not really any flaws i can find in it's a wonderful life like the pacing is really well done. The performances are all stellar. The directing is great. Like it's, uh, weirdly enough, I don't think it was the smash hit that you might think it was when it first came out. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it was a moderate success, but even for Frank Capra, I don't think it did as well as some of those other ones. It's almost like gained more appreciation over time. Yeah. Kind of like Wizard of Oz, right? Right, right, right. um, which I fucking hate Wizard of Oz. Oh, do you really? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I do not like that movie. Uh, I, I like it, but, um, well, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, but okay. uh, No, let's debate Wizard of Oz right now. We should do a Wizard of Oz episode for sure, yeah, though. We yeah, we should, actually. Um, Maybe you'll help me find some appreciation for it. I mean, look, I... To me, it's just a bit long. It, it, it's it's yeah. it's when they decide. To me, the movie feels like it should have ended when they're approaching the wizard, mm. and then the movie goes on for like another twenty <laughs> or half an hour. But to yeah. me, I'm like, oh god, there's like like there's more. Um, well, we won't get too hung up on that, but we'll we'll do an episode on it. There's sometime. that poppy scene really where it looks like there's it. snow coming down. That's that's kind of Christmassy. Is that the one? 
From Wizard of Oz? Ooh, yeah, we're the, oh. they're, they're in the poppy fields and it's snowing. Oh, okay, okay. That's, that's you're just the trying to, you're just really <laughs> grasping at straws yeah, to, to yeah. draw, to dr bring this It wasn't snow, it was asbestos. <laughs> it actually was asbestos. Yeah, that probably yeah. was what killed them all. But, um, yeah. yeah, well... Uh, anyways, yeah, I, I don't have too much more to say. Like with It's a Wonderful Life, like it's really only like, the last little chunk that's Christmassy, and and most of the movie is not. So there's not a ton <clears> of things that I'll say about it as as far as the like. That's the only reason why it might not have been number one on my list, just because mm -hmm. there's so much in the movie that isn't well, okay, a okay. Christmas yeah, movie. It's not, it doesn't quite qualify in a really strong way. But again, it's got some great shots and cinematography and stuff. And mm -hmm. there's actually, there's a black and white version and there's a color version, I believe, too. I'm yeah. pretty sure I watched, I think I watched the color version. The more, actually, I saw, the, there's a more, the, there's an old colored version, which is like, the, the old Ted Turner colorization is garbage. But there's mm -hmm. a more recent colorization that I'm like, I fuck, think, where was, like, I wish I could have watched the movie like this for I the think, first time. I think I saw that, the newer one. Because yeah. the one I saw was pretty, looks pretty good, actually. Yeah. And it was, it was beautifully colored. Was that the one? It starts where they're like sledding and they break through the ice and the kids. Yeah, I mean them. it's not like the very first scene, but that's really early in the movie. Yeah, right, okay, and okay. and that's where uh, George Bailey uh, goes deaf in one ear because of that, right, which yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, has a small yeah. sort of play into it and stuff. But uh, yeah, no, I remember it was on a VHS tape when I was a kid. That had a bunch of other movies on it that I was much more into because they were more modern. And then mm -hmm. whenever the movie would end, the beginning of It's a Wonderful Life would start. And it would be the uh, part where there's just like the angels in the space. They're just talking to each other yeah, and there's themes right, of light. Right, right. And I would just I would watch it for a few minutes and just be like, God, this is boring. Yeah. And I would just always turn it off, <laughs> like not realizing that it would later become like one of my favorites. Yeah, so funny. But, wow. um, but yeah. it, you know, that's interesting. I, I, I actually love I think. It's got some really beautiful opening shots of like the city streets and it's all yeah. snowy and it like pans over to the house and man, stuff like that just yeah is great. And and stuff like that, it, it's simple too. It's just sequences and shots like that that kind of draw you into a story as well. It kind of reveals this environment to you. Yeah. And, you know, you're starting off on this adventure. But I, I really like movies that have kind of a slow, calm, soothing sort of start that sort of massage you into the story you know well, I love as how, opposed to just like smacking you in the yeah, face yeah I, I love that they, they they really put a large little chunk at the beginning to when he's a, a kid before yeah, they really yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and that was, that was great stuff, stuff too. yeah and yeah. it's like he's a character where he's almost he's so perfect <clears throat> That that's almost the flaw of like you're like is does somebody like George Bailey actually exist in real life? Yeah, Could anyone actually yeah. be like that good and wholesome? But there's some great range. Like I think it's actually one of Jimmy Stewart's best performances because mm. as as well as most of the movie, like he he goes through quite an age range too. Like I think yeah, he's supposed to yeah. be maybe in his late teens or early twenties when he, when he first shows up as Jimmy Stewart. Right. Okay. And then he kind of ages into his. I guess into his thirties and so, but there's, there's like a, yeah. a large amount of growth and like, yeah, wow. I was forgetting that it takes place over such a time span. Yeah. Um, like the girl, like his like love interest. Like I think she, she's still like in high school mm -hmm. when he first comes back and everything. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I, I've, like, cause I've only seen it the one time too. Hey, eh? so again, it's not, I was sort of forgetting some of these things, but as you're talking about it, it's like, Oh yeah, I'm being reminded of, yeah. All that stuff that happens. Well, most of the movie is just him <clears throat> having his dreams just shattered one by one and him just sort of right. being like, well, I got to do the right thing. Yeah. And then by the time it gets to the end of the movie and everything's kind of just turned to shit, he's just sort of like, all I tried to do was the right thing over and over again. And all it did was fuck me over. And he's mm -hmm. like bona fideably like a dick, like towards the end of the, like before mm -hmm. the whole angel stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it, and it's not that he's, well, that's where the, a lot of the movie, it's like, it's like a downfall story. Well, he's having know? a nervous but, breakdown, right? Yeah, he's like, yeah, he's yeah. like, I literally, it's, 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 it's cause he loves his family. He's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do, mm -hmm. which is why he's then like, he's like shouting at his kids and just kind of being a dick and just, yeah, yeah. because he's just sort of like everything in my life has gone wrong. Yeah. yeah and all yeah, I did yeah. was try to do the right thing. Yeah. And well, that's where uh, it's so, probably such an impactful movie too, because I think often doing the right thing and not getting rewarded for it does feel that way. Well, yeah. And, you know? and the unique thing is like, if you do the right thing, People do take notice, which is why mm -hmm. he was saved at the end. All these people were like, we're not going to let George Bailey go down. Like, yeah, like everybody yeah. like talks about all the things that he did. And so in the end of the movie, it is this sort <clears> of <throat> karma 
of all of those good things he did did come back to him in the end. Yeah, and it yeah. was based on his character and the type of person he was, yeah, not totally, just that they were like, totally. oh, we're going to... I don't think they would have done that for anybody in that town. They did it because it was the George Bailey character, mm-hmm. right? And so it's kind of like saying like, yeah, you know, if you do... I mean, I don't think the message is trying to say like, do good things so that good things happen to you, but it's trying to say like, there is... Uh, we're, there are things that are more important than money, mm-hmm. like good friends and family. And if you have those good relationships, like things like money could actually uh, come towards you in good fortune because of those more important things, which are the right. relationships. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I pro- I'm probably good for uh, It's a Wonderful Life, unless there was some other things you wanted to say about it. Um, basically, it's no, like... No, I think that covers it pretty... Well. Okay. Yeah. For me, I mean, like, there's really only other, like, there's really only two other titles I wouldn't mind to, um, get in into our episode for sure. Yeah, for sure. Let's um, talk about them. Well, first I'll bring up uh, one of them. You can definitely talk about the other one, not so much. So I'm just wondering, would it be better for me to just get out of the way the one that maybe you wouldn't have too much to say? Yeah, just drop um, it in there and we'll see. What I, I got to bring up Gremlins because it was just it was it's one of my all time favorite uh, movies. Man. Especially so, as a kid, I'm so looking forward to watching this because you've you've pumped me up sufficiently for well, that's it. That's what and I'm then, worried about. Well, You're gonna watch me and be like, it was okay. <laughs> no, the, so the <laughs> other day, or the other night, I started watching it and I was just really tired. So I, I started watching it and I got just through the opening credits and I was like, fuck, I'm I'm gonna love watching this movie. I just it, it was giving me all the good the right vibes and everything. Um, and I, uh, I just, I just had to. I wanted to watch it properly when I wasn't just going to fall asleep in the middle of it. So I, mm-hmm. I shut it off and I decided I'll, I'll, I'll put it off for another night. But I'm going to get around to it this Christmas for sure. And how- uh, those opening credits were great, though. <laughs> like, how much do you know about Gremlins? Like, just as a premise, like, not like really aside- much at all. I just know that there's these you know weird the little creatures. No, no, I don't fucking. Let's just pretend, let's just act like I don't know a damn thing about okay. gremlins. Well, no, no, that's actually good. Like, I think the less you know, the better it is. Because I thought, like, you know, sometimes you watch a movie where you've never seen it. Yeah. But you know so much about it, you might as well have seen it. Yeah, you yeah, know? right, right, So I right. wasn't sure if, I, I wasn't sure if maybe that was the case with, with gremlins where you're like, well, I'm, I know all the stuff that happens. I guess I'll just make sense of it all by watching it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um yeah, I, I mean, I would be interested to see what your take is on it, just seeing fresh eyes on it for the first time, as opposed to like someone like me who's, you know, been watching that movie when I was in, like, single digits. Yeah, um, so you, so that was when you first watched it then, hey? Oh, I was definitely a kid when I first saw it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like, again, like, it was, as a child, Gremlins, or maybe more so Gremlins 2, like, those were, like, I don't even know if those were my favorite movies, but if someone said, like, what's your favorite movies, I would just be, like, Gremlins. Okay. Yeah. Um... But it wasn't because of the Christmas stuff. That's the funny thing was like, it wasn't until kind of like later that I was like, oh, it's also a Christmas movie. But well, when that's you not told when me I... that it was a Christmas movie, that really surprised me because I, I, I'd heard about it for so long and knew that they're like these kind of little creep creatures. Well, the interesting... But, but, and I always thought of it as being a horror movie. So it is a horror movie. Is it kind I of mean, like a it's, monster? It's, yeah, it's not a rated R movie. It's actually one of the first movies that created the PG-13 rating. Oh, okay. Um... And it was originally meant to be a rated R movie. In fact, I think originally what was happening was it kind of spawned off of in the early 80s before E.T., Spielberg was going to make a sort of horrific alien movie that later kind of turned into E.T. Hmm. Well, he kind of switched gears and went into E.T., but a lot of the ideas that he had for that alien horror movie, he was like, let's push that into gremlins okay because it is a spielberg produced movie i noticed and i was wondering to myself like how much is this gonna feel like a spielberg movie you know like we talked about poltergeist and how that was essentially a probably more spielberg directed than yeah uh, gremlins probably doesn't feel as much as poltergeist just because spielberg was literally there on the sets you know mm, like i just think okay. he was that much more involved yeah. i would say gremlins feels about as spielbergish as maybe say back to the future might okay okay maybe a bit more so it's- um like the qualities are definitely there but you can also just sort of be like oh if spielberg had made gremlins it mm-hmm. would have been an even bigger budget you know yeah, that's right, the only right. element that would have been a bit different and um and it was basically so it was a spec script of Chris Columbus that was like kind of what 
started his career. It was a script that never was meant to even be made. Oh, he wrote the movie? Chris yeah. Columbus did? Yeah, yeah. So oh, he, um, interesting. There's actually a reference to Gremlins in The Goonies because he made he wrote The Goonies also, right? But Gremlins oh, was wow. first. Fuck. Um, and it was really I just... Forgot it, a, yeah. It was I, a spec script. It was just a way for him to be like, this will never get made, but this is just an idea of my... Uh, quality of script writing, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. to get other jobs. Yeah. Um, but they were like, this is a really original idea. Like, we should make this. But yeah. uh, the script was apparently much darker. It, that was a horror movie. And yeah. they were like, let's, <laughs> let's lighten it up. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's not decapitate the mom. <laughs> and, it, it, is, uh, it is funny, too, because, like, I know Chris Columbus loves Christmas so much. Um, it makes sense that he would have written it as a, is, you know, set around Christmas. Yeah, suppose. well... So a lot of people, I think, have lost this element because now we just think of Gremlins as this Gremlins movie. But it had this brilliant marketing. Gremlins was almost a troll of a movie. And what, mm. I'm, what I mean by that was the movie was kind of pranking you on what the movie actually was. Once the movie was out and it was a huge hit, then it was just sort of like, yeah, it's, it's Gremlins. But the original poster was just a box with like little gizmo hands kind of poking out of the box and it was made to be the movie was marketed as a cutesy fun family Christmas movie with a little cuddly furry creature yeah, that right. was the idea and then when you went to see the movie and the the first half of the movie is that mm-hmm. and then halfway through the movie you're like whoa, whoa, whoa what 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 is this now <laughs> which is why like the classic poster is actually it's that box with gizmo mm-hmm. and then there's a gremlin bursting through like tearing through the poster basically okay and then that became the poster that we all know mm. but the movie was kind of made to prank viewers into thinking that they were seeing like a holiday christmas movie that yeah. then How about gets, a cute little creature yeah. that's like a stuffed animal yeah and they were like thing. oh well, that's enough of a premise right there it's like it's like yeah. et mm-hmm. that's what mm-hmm. we're getting it's a steven spielberg production mm-hmm. we know exactly what this is and then they're like they flipped it on its head and you're mm-hmm. like no 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 this isn't even a christmas movie this is a movie that's like ripping on <laughs> all that stuff and it's really yeah, more of a horror movie. Nice. Although, I mean, I, I really do say horror uh, lightly. I mean, there's, I guess there is a little bit of well, <laughs> murder. It's a PG-13 I don't want to say gremlins don't kill people because they definitely do in the movie, but it's like there's nothing very, there's nothing gore. If there's any gore in the movie, it's harm done to gremlins. <laughs> You're not seeing blood okay. spurting out of people yeah. um, in this movie. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I really do think it's, to me, it's like, it's just such a, cl- like, like even just aside from Christmas, it's just such a classic film that everybody uh, needs to see Gremlins. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that is a must watch. What yeah. else have we got on the list here to talk about? Well, another one that um, I wanted to bring up at least briefly that I know you can say some things about, because actually most of the ones on my list... Uh, have been talked about. I'm not going to go into Black Christmas because we've already covered that a bit. Yeah. Um, but the other one... But it's one, a great Christmas movie. It just, well, <laughs> it really does have a lot of the great qualities and feels of a Christmas yeah. movie. Again, I love the intro to it, right? Like, just yeah. that shot of that house. Yeah. And they're playing Silent Night or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's kind of this um, choir version of it. It's just... just Did you know you into the that movie. the director of Black Christmas is the director of A Christmas Story? Bob Clark. That's right. Fuck. He made two of the greatest Christmas oh, movies wow. of all time. That guy loves Christmas as much as Chris <laughs> Columbus. Yeah. Apparently. And and like but but what like uh, just just wow. to you know not there's not enough love to Bob Clark as a director and that's why I kind of yeah. want to just say this briefly cuz I, I find he's actually quite underrated. The fact that that man <clears throat> can do horror and comedy mm-hmm. so well is I think a real testament to him as a storyteller. Yeah. Um he also yeah. did Porky's. Okay, I haven't seen that. Oh, okay. I don't really know much about that. But. I, I just I only bring it up because like that was uh, for the longest time the most successful Canadian movie that was ever made. So oh, he, okay. he really had like some real hits. Um, yeah, and yeah, yet totally. he's never really thrown in that category of great filmmakers. It mm-hmm, seems. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, the other movie I wanted to bring up briefly because I know that we both talked about it and we both agree it's a classic staple of this time of year. Uh, it would just be funny if this is what we're going to end it on. I don't know. Maybe you have a few other other titles on your list, but I was going to say we got to talk about Ernest Saves Christmas. Oh fuck! Well, that's a great place to end <laughs> it because I was looking over the things we hadn't talked about yet, 
And let me just touch on a few of them. I'd written down um, Jack Frost. Which one? The one with uh, <laughs> Michael The horror Keaton one there. where Shannon Elizabeth gets raped by a snowman? Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> the funny thing is like those movies came out almost in the same year, and apparently yeah. kids would switch out the tapes. Oh, that's hilarious. To just traumatize of children. That's what kids would do yeah. in those days. <laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking of that Michael Keaton movie. And again, mm-hmm. I don't I don't like love that movie, but it's just like one that I watched back in the day. Um, I wrote down Elf because I know it's really beloved by Friends a lot in of Vancouver. people. Vancouver. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's my buddy's right. actually an elf. Yeah, one of my oh, actor fun. buddies. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's sweet. Yeah. Who does uh, he play? Uh, there's a scene. It's like a big like conference meeting room. It's mm-hmm. a scene that got, it's the scene that got, has Peter Dinklage in it, and oh, Will okay. Ferrell's like, "Oh my God!" It's an e-, like like and yeah, Peter Dinklage gets yeah, really yeah, angry yeah. with oh, him okay, because okay. he's like calling him an elf. Nice. Um, but my buddy, he's like one of like the CEO guys at that right. uh, table. Um, but uh, do you want to name drop your friend for the sake of Val? Uh, Simon Charles Tilby, if you're if you're listening, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, yeah, no, Elf was a, a fun again. That was Elf was one of those ones where I'm like, I don't know what it is with Christmas movies in general, but Christmas movies, whenever a new one comes out, I'm just sort of like, well, that's a movie I'm never going to see. And then like yeah. five to ten years later, I finally get around to watching them, and, mm-hmm. I, and then I kind of find that they're not that bad. Yeah, sometimes they are, right? Like it's kind of like. So, okay, so Elf is one, um, because I didn't watch that when it first came out, and I wasn't that interested in it. Yeah. But then a lot of people said a lot of good things, and I know, like, Mm -hmm. especially, I do find that there's a lot of people who are kind of just just barely a generation younger than us, kind of. Yeah, yeah. They tend to have gravitated towards it a lot. So they're like, oh, I love Elf. It's one of my favorite movies. And um, you, you know, know I, I gotta I, say, like it's it's a decent uh, decent movie. I don't have the same. It, it, it's not as like beloved to me as it is for them, probably. Yeah. But like, it's, w- what's weird is like I, lo- I I enjoy Will Ferrell, but usually not in like the family friendly <laughs> movies. Right. Okay. The person who I maybe find who makes me maybe laugh the most in Elf is James Caan because mm. he's just the straight man who has to just put up with Will Ferrell and yeah, in yeah. no way is he meant to be the funny one but he's the one I relate to in that movie yeah, where yeah. I'm just like, I understand for sure yeah yeah and um well and that one of the other things I love about it is just kind of all the Rankin Bass Rudolph references it does have that well. feel that, that the, the way the costumes and like everything's yeah, like overly they, like clean they and did that very and, intentionally uh, hey yeah. like I was watching a behind the scenes segment and they were talking about all that yeah. But um yeah, another example of a movie that was like that that I didn't watch it when it came out was The Holiday. And again, to me that was just like, okay, it's going to be like this cheesy rom-com or whatever. And it kind of is, but it's like it's actually a pretty well-done romantic comedy for what it is. Like it's actually So I watched it just the other night for the first time, actually. And um it's not actually half bad. Like I think it's aged pretty well characters are genuine there's some some genuine funny moments i like the characters um and it's you know there's actually like it's emotionally moving and it puts you in a uh i don't know just it makes you feel things <laughs> for, for as whereas opposed to a lot of um those rom-coms can be kind of just lame and irritating or whatever but yeah, the holiday was one of those. Um, I know you were saying you haven't seen Love Actually. That's a pretty good, pretty good one. I've seen uh, Santa Claus versus the Devil. Oh, fuck, you ever that's see a that great one? one. No, I haven't watched that. No. It's one of those movies that it's a, it's one of those genuinely it's so bad it's good mm-hmm. kind of movies. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I, I quite it enjoyed sounds it. Sounds so bad, like it's good. Yeah, well, it's got like one of the lowest ratings on IMDb, and oh, wow. um, it's speaking just of, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of terrible one, like there was a movie that is actually just bad. Okay. <laughs> uh, Christmas in Wonderland. Hmm. But what's special about this movie to me? Now it actually has Tim Curry in it, and it has Carmen Electra, and it had Patrick Swayze in it, I believe, too. Okay. But they shot it at West Edmonton Mall. Which was, like, to me, West Edmonton Mall has always been, like, this beloved place that we would go. And especially around Christmas time, they got the decorations up and stuff. And it's like, you go to West Edmonton Mall and you know Christmas is coming. It's sort of how I feel about about it. So I've got a lot of sentimentality attached to West Edmonton Mall. But they made this really lousy Christmas in Wonderland movie, which absolutely blows and unfortunately, it doesn't really 
do a great job of um, making use of Wested, I suppose, in a good way. Oh, it also has, like, Chris Catan, I think, in it. Okay. I don't know. It's something. I mean, it's an that's an interesting cast. I guess it's just like a very basic run of the mill. Like, see that my problem is yeah, like they it, make it's so lame. many. It's a super lame, right? It's one of yeah. those things where, again, the the villains are are too. Th- there's too much buffoonery going on with the villains, so you can't take it seriously at all. Um, it's just it's well, just, just stupid. And this it's, is, it's an example of a movie that does it all wrong. I think part of the reason why I'm so avoidant of a lot of Christmas movies is like it almost seems to be like an industry in of itself. Mm-hmm. Like there's making movies and there's almost like these other industries that are specifically just making Christmas movies for this brief period of the year. Yeah. We're just all, like never mind the hallmarks that come out, but just every and then everything else that just comes out. It's like if it's Christmas themed, it's coming out at this time. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's like you have to really try to like figure you have to like pick through all of these kind of like garbage movies that were never meant to be good they Mm -hmm. were just meant to exist and then every now and then you're like oh there's actually like a few genuine holiday movies that are like quality yeah that are just sort of like you know in this needle in a haystack Mm -hmm. um but they just and thankfully we've we've got enough of them over time that it seems like there's a lot of them (laughs) yeah yeah but yeah. Um, well, I guess the thing is, like, for every memorable Christmas movie, there's probably like three dozen. Oh yeah. Stinkers. Yeah. Tell me about it. Um, we I, don't have to talk about that anymore. It's. I just wanted to. Were you a big fan of? I, I just realized it was. Um, I'm sure you've seen it. I'm just surprised, like, because I guess neither of us really brought it up. Did you ever see? Or 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 I, you did see it. I'm sure, but I don't know if you're a big fan of like just the Santa Claus. Oh yeah, I was going to mention that too. Yeah. And I like the first one. I think the second, or there, there's a bunch of sequels, and some of the there's there's aspect. I don't think the sequels are like horrendous, but uh, you know the first one is really what it's all about. That's the only one I've seen is is the first one. Yeah, the um, second one might be okay. The third one was kind of getting a little worse, and then it got worse and worse. Still. Yep. It's, it's, but, Milk uh, it to death. Yeah. 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 Did you ever see Bad Santa? I did. I think there's a sequel, but I think I only saw the first one. Yeah, I only would have seen the first um, one, too. It was fine. I, you know, it was one of those movies, like, I didn't find it overly that funny, mm-hmm. but it was funny enough. But yeah. I, I, I kind of felt it was a bit, o- like, some people really love Bad Santa. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people just relate to alcoholics maybe and just being like ah this guy's like awesome and i'm kind of like he's kind of a loser i think you're missing the point of the movie Mm -hmm. but uh but it was yeah no it's um it's fine it's not quite on my classic list the way certain other type of titles are but it does seem like it's becoming more of a classic to other people i guess yeah with Um, that movie like i I i've got no problem with crude movies mm -hmm. but it was like crude in the way that i don't want to see a movie be crude like i guess well, i just yeah it was almost it was just um the whole note seemed to have been crude like i'm sure there yeah, was a, yeah. a scene or That's, two that had some heart to make you like the billy bob thorn character more i just can't think of what that scene would have been you know yeah um, not, maybe not it was really just, at all maybe like, one little was there, was there one little scene where he kind of bonds with the boy maybe i don't, I don't totally i don't totally remember there's some charming elements to their relationship yeah. i find but that, um, that's a classic and, and it is funny but it's just like i don't know i was kind of like i kind of felt dirty after watching exactly it, I yeah well that's a good example of what i was saying about the ironic christmas movie where nobody who really is a fan <clears> of bad <throat> santa is because they like Christmas movies. You know what mm-hmm, I mean? Like they're mm-hmm. watching it despite the Christmas stuff. Yeah, the, the Christmas right. thing is just the scenario that's presented in. Sure. But uh, they could care less about uh, Santa Claus and all of that stuff. It's more about watching a guy be uh, debaucherous or whatever. And I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it, I guess bottom line was I just didn't find it. It just didn't bring me enough laughs to be like, oh, that's a great comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair um, enough. But it's, yeah, It's I guess it's probably one of the, better or memorable Christmas movies of the last 20 years, I, I guess. I'll, I'll try to give yeah, it that. Yeah, at least in the sense that people still talk about it, so that yeah. tells you something. Um, I mean, I guess it's weird to think about it, but, you know, some people... Oh, did you ever see Trading Places? See, that's another one where it's it's got a Christmas element, but it's not really a Christmas I movie. I haven't seen that, no. Okay. Um, or, uh, well, I mean, it's funny. I mean, you could you could argue Eyes Wide Shut is a Christmas movie. Yeah, fuck. Oh, that's one of the things <laughs> I love about Eyes Wide Shut. Is again, 
<laughs> it's not the orgy sequences. It's that Christmas. Now you're tree. making me want to watch. It again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be funny too. I'm now at that stage where I'm like, I've watched Eyes Wide Shut enough times that I'm like. I might want to watch it just for the Christmas yeah, stuff. Yeah, just for the holidays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a feel-good holiday film. Ah, just for those, for those FAO Schwartz Toy Store <laughs> sequences. And it, and it really, it does, like, when it when it does have the Christmas moments, it's fairly Christmassy, mm-hmm. you know? Like, mm-hmm. I love the, the well, elite love the Christmas parties. I love the whole walking around the street and stuff it, yeah. it, at night, and, you know, it's snowy out. You got the lights on yeah. in the stores yeah. and stuff. It's got some good holiday vibes going totally, on there. Totally, yeah, yeah. But... Um, uh, well, I don't know. Should we bring it back to Ernest? Yeah, or? let's do that. We've <laughs> talked about enough. I was going to mention like Ernest the miracle. Ernest saved the episode. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Let's. Uh, I was going to mention the miracle on Thirty Fourth oh, Street. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk bunch, about? The, I've never seen any really. of them, I but I know the premise. To, to say that they exist, and there was like a, a remake. There was there was an old one, I think, with Shirley Temple. Again, there's been a whole bunch of them, so I don't know which old it, one uh, I watched. But then there was like or was the, it the Na- 90s was it Natalie one. Wood maybe as the girl. Oh, that might have been the one that I or actually watched. I thought there was a Shirley Temple one too. But oh, maybe uh, yeah. Anyway, so did you see the remake exist. or uh, I watched the '90s one? Yeah, okay. And it was like, I mean, I didn't. The Richard it, Attenborough it Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was just fine, you know. I don't yeah. really love or hate those movies, but they do exist. I, I think, uh, we funny the, enough, I remember mentioned. hearing that I think John Hughes, I think that was one of those, so in the 90s, John Hughes was uh, <clears throat> kind of a, uh, what would be the term, like a, a script doctor or a ghost writer on a number of um, movies in the 90s where he wasn't getting credited for them. Okay. And I think that Miracle on 34th Street was one of them. He, oh, he actually might, it might okay. actually be credited with John Hughes as one of the writers, but um, I, I know that he was involved. Uh, um, he might have just chosen maybe not to get the credit for it. Like, I think he also did some writing yeah. for Flubber, and oh, <laughs> there's, like, gotcha. a number of movies where, like, I, I think he wrote a bit for... There was a number of these kind of, like, uh, a lot of Disney kind of family movies in the 90s. Okay, yeah. Uh, like I know he wrote like the, uh, Dennis the Menace movie of the nineties. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, never saw, <clears throat> never saw any of those miracle, uh, on the uh, 34th streets. Maybe, okay. maybe one day. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, they're, de- they're not must sees for me, Yeah, but I know they are often talked about and they're fairly famous. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Ernest Saves Christmas on the other hand is a movie that doesn't get talked about enough Yeah, because... <laughs> And and this is a movie that people should see. I feel like you know it's yeah. it's one that you probably would have known about if you were around in the earnest days when they were yeah. big. But I like otherwise, you, were, if, you probably just wouldn't have heard about. If them. people were our age, I think most people our age and 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 definitely a bit older definitely would have seen this movie. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about as much for the younger generations. I, I could see this <clears> something <throat> something that could be still airing on Disney Plus or uh, or, or just airing yeah. on TV. Uh, <laughs> Um, but whether kids today will connect with the Ernest character, I guess that would be the big question is maybe kids today might just sort of be like, what's this like Ernest guy all about? I don't know. Um, Again, it's like, um, what was it that you said you're... Somebody somebody referred to Ernest as like redneck. He's like the redneck Pee Wee Herman. Yeah. In a way. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, there was like a number of these kind of, I don't know, yeah, something happened in like the 80s and early 90s. I find him a 90s. lot more appealing than Pee Wee, Her- Pee Wee Herman myself. Well, he made a hell of a lot more movies as okay. that character than, than Pee Wee did. Um, yeah, no, well, there's something, there's something about Pee Wee that's, I think, purposefully meant to be a little bit creepy. Like Pee Wee was originally meant for adults, mm-hmm. while Ernest was originally like a brand ambassador for commercials that was Mm. uh like it started with one commercial and then they were like let's have them do all of these different local brands Mm. and then it just kind of grew and grew until um into this phenomenon it was yeah well it was it was so it was actually disney caught on to it because there was some event i was reading this recently about how there was some event where someone came out as dressed up as Mickey Mouse and there was a bit of an applause from the audience and then Ernest came out and he got a way huger (laughs) applause than Mickey Mouse and that's when Disney was like we gotta make we gotta start getting this guy in movies Um, and he was a really talented guy like he I think I think kind of Ernest or Jim Verney, I think he kind of did come from maybe somewhat of a rednecky kind of uh, background, okay. but, but he was a very intelligent guy. He was Shakespearean trained. Like mm-hmm. he was so much more than what that Ernest 
character was that he was portraying. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I think had he had lived on, uh, <clears throat> we would have seen more of those talents. I think just Hollywood, if I'm, unfortunately when you become really successful at something, Hollywood kind of pigeonholes you as this thing that you do really yeah. well. Well, and again, he's he's a character that's branded as a, a, an imbecile, kind of, or a buffoon. Yeah. But, um, you know, that, uh, again, earlier we were, we were mentioning other characters that are similar to that. It's like Mr. Bean, mm-hmm. Ewa Herman, they're... they're these imbecile characters. It's kind of like man-children. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But that doesn't say anything about the actors who portray them, really. Uh, oh, yeah, no, if anything... Those, those guys are often very intelligent and, again, well-trained and yeah. great actors and, and just they've, they've unfortunately become so strongly associated with this one uh, role that they portray that they maybe get... Uh, become perceived as that character rather than who they really are. Well, what's great is uh, all those early Ernest movies, because, um, I, again, I haven't really seen, like, the later ones, so I wouldn't really know, but those early Disney ones, they mm-hmm. always uh, created scenarios in the movies where Ernest would get to play different characters. Like, he would have to get into a disguise yeah, 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 and yeah. play somebody else because they That's were just sort so of like... That's about them. Like, in Ernest yeah. Saves Christmas, he becomes that, like, snake... The snake, snake wrangler. Guy, yeah. <laughs> does, okay, does he... Uh, there's a character he does... Let, let me know if this is familiar, because I don't know if he does this character in the Christmas one, but he plays... He, he's in drag. He plays this woman who usually has, like, this neck oh, brace. Oh, That's such a creepy... Kinda, yeah, but... Yeah, so uh, she, she's totally in Ernest Saves Christmas. Yeah. And she's... It's, she she's she's shows up in so a few of the movies. creepy. <laughs> but I remember watching that as a kid, and... And almost like not even knowing that it was him. Well, he's passable. Like you're like, there are older women who are kind of like that. They just grow into these just almost like there's just no, there's no femininity left. Right, right, right. uh, And the funny thing is, is that watching that woman, it was like, it was like, I felt like I know this lady. Like I know her from church or I know her from the library She's got to be like, that has to be like an aunt of Ernest or something. Like he's, he's playing somebody that he knows, I feel. Yeah. And yeah, Yeah. she, that, that persona (laughs) I think pops up in almost all of the Ernest movies, like just for like a Uh, sequence or so. That's hilarious that you mentioned it because I was kind of starting to forget that. I I wouldn't have thought of it until you mentioned it. Weirdly enough, the girl, the girl that Ernest kind of takes into his wing the mm-hmm. kind of like the troubled girl who's running She's, who runs yeah. away from him. She has been in my backyard of the house that I grew up in as a kid, because uh, there was one movie that w- there was a TV movie that was shot at my house. It was this like true story uh, crime case that happened, mm-hmm. and she played the girl. She played Amy Fisher. It was an, it yeah. was the Amy Fisher story, and she got to play Amy Fisher. I didn't know this till way oh. later that it was the same actress because I was like, wow. she reminds me of somebody. And um, but yeah, it was like Amy Fisher was like a New Jersey girl, so I guess they got this Jersey girl to play the okay, role, okay. but they did it in Canada, and so. I just sort of like, oh shit, the, the, the earnest girl has like been at my house. <laughs> That's um, crazy. Also, I wanted to just sort of throw in real quick. And she's so classic 80s in that movie, too. Yeah. Like she's got like the ponytail coming out the Very, side oh of her God, hair so and just like the colorful and, uh, clothes that are baggy. And yeah, yeah. Man. <laughs> So, uh, when did that movie actually come out? I want to say 88, maybe that 87 or 88. Right. That's, that's another one of those movies that I feel like I've been watching it as far back as I can remember. Like, yeah. I swear the first time I watched it was before I was even developing memories. Well, one thing uh, I also want to really uh, touch in with that movie, because I just feel like it's probably not a common that people will bring up much with Ernest Saves Christmas. Oh, is um, IMDb has it listed as Ernest Saves Santa. That's bullshit. Is, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the title on IMDb is wrong. The poster calls it Ernest Saves Christmas, so that's clearly like... It is yeah. Ernest Saves Christmas. I don't know why they have it listed there might as- Sometimes like the European posters get like a slightly different title maybe or like some yeah. places in the world sometimes they do put different titles but i've always right. known it as ernest saves christmas yeah um, 1988 anyway just yeah. to answer the question another thing i just wanted to bring up about the movie was and i almost <clears> feel <throat> like this was just by accident i mean i'm sure they wanted to get the best guy they could but the guy who plays santa in that movie is like he plays it so genuinely and heartfeltly yeah, yeah. like i think he's, he's one of like the one best of- one of the best cr- santa character uh, performances I, was, uh, I can think of. I was going to say that too. And you know, it's funny because I was just thinking about this the other day. I was like, who is like the definitive Santa Claus actor? Like the best one that's out there. Yeah, yeah. And I hadn't, I'd forgotten about his, but that's probably one of them. He's for quite sure. a good like, one. Yeah. He's such a, 
you know, sweet old man, but also yeah. plays it in this way that's believable. Like this, he's this magical wizard kind of, and um, very like genuinely warm person. Yeah, the voice is right. Like I think he was mm-hmm. a British actor, or, mm-hmm. or 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 maybe Irish, or maybe he's just putting on a little bit of an accent. But yeah. it's and he's like like he's not overly fat either. Like he's yeah. he's yeah. like chubby but you know he he's able to like move around yeah, and jolly. and yeah he's just he's got that twinkle in his eye and like everybody else gets rosy cheeks everybody gets so frustrated with Ernest, and mm-hmm. i'm sure santa claus does too but they picked the great guy who like you can see he's so <clears throat> patient like he puts up with almost everything Ernest puts him through yeah, yeah. because he is santa claus and is just so wholesome mm-hmm. that um that he'll you know he'll let Ernest uh you know do his thing yeah but um yeah, it's it's almost like I mean it's a great movie so I'm I'm not it's not a shame that he's in it but it's almost like a shame that he they didn't he didn't they didn't cast him in a more Santa Claus focused movie I guess yeah, cuz I'm yeah. like oh he was like so good at it it's funny that it's an, an earnest movie of all things, as opposed right. to um like around that same time there was a or maybe it was a little bit earlier there was actually a movie that I remember watching as a kid, it was just called the Santa Claus movie or, or Santa Claus, okay. the movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it was like this really, it was like a super high budgeted Hollywood movie that kind of bombed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually not that you watch it now and you're kind of like, oh, it's actually, there's some impressive stuff in there. Um, but, uh, but then you get this like little like earnest movie and you're like, I think that's a much better Santa Claus, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And, and their focus was probably not like, let's get the best Santa we can. They were yeah. just sort of like, this guy happened to audition and he's clearly the best. Let's uh, do it. And uh, well, there's, there's so many different interpretations of Santa Claus too, right? In terms of how he is visual, like some, some depict Santa as tall and being more wizardly and yeah, yeah. having like a long robe, whereas other ones depict him as being more fat. Sometimes he's got white gloves. Other times he's got black mitts mm-hmm. um, or green mitts or, you know, there's like, yeah, slimmer ones, taller ones, shorter ones, stubbier ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess to us, like the, uh, the, the most famous archetype of Santa I think of is like the, the one created by Coca-Cola. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're always trying to get back to that one basically. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about Ernest Saves <clears> Christmas, <throat> um, that we could bring up. I don't know. It's, uh. Yeah. It's just, again, it's that thing that the 80s did so well where I don't think of Ernest Age Christmas as a kid's movie. I think of these as family movies. Right, right. Which is why we can still enjoy them. Yeah, and Um, you can still appreciate it as an adult. It's not too stupid. Yeah. The one thing I always think about it, as soon as I think of Ernest Saves Christmas, the first thing that I think about is those two guys who work in... (laughs) The like the with, warehouse, yeah, yeah, and, and dealing the, with the reindeer, the, the reindeer yeah. being on the roof. So those two guys are actually those are reoccurring characters that show up in again. I can't speak for the later uh, Ernest movies, but they've been in every Ernest movie that I've seen. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so th- it's just always a different dynamic that they uh, they have. Although I think the skinny the, the the big guys in all of them, and I think in the first movie he had a different partner, and they switch him out with. Uh, the guy you're thinking of. Okay. And then that guy's been in all of them since then. But, uh, but yeah, no, that's like a great little like side storyline. Um, yeah. it's a nice kind of, um, you know, the premise too of like, which, which is, it's not an uncommon premise for you to have a classic, um, kind of iconic character who's trying to find their replacement, right? I mean, I think they've done like that with Batman. They did it in The Mask of Zorro. That's basically what it is. It's and, older and, Zorro and, is trying yeah. to find the new younger Zorro. And, and, and the Willy Santa Wonka, Claus, kind of. right? The Santa Claus, yeah. too, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, it's another one of those stories where it's like the guy, Santa, is trying to find the, the right replacement for himself. And mm-hmm. it's uh, that younger guy who was decent enough as well, but not as good as the main Santa Claus. I always, uh, that's the part of the that kind of always irks <laughs> me is when like they truly pass the torch over. I'm just sort of like, yeah, if it does, you know, if, 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 fuck, if like, he's, he's enough, okay, but, but he's not, he's not the other guy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. Like I would, I, I think, uh, that movie would still age pretty well today. If you, 
yeah. showed it. it I don't is, know. It's just, it's weird. It's a weird movie that has a weird vibe to it. And whenever it I is, think of it, yeah. it really stands out. But it is so of its time, you know? Yeah. And Do you I remember the part where he goes and visits his buddy Vern? So uh, the, the Vern character is a camera POV. Right. <laughs> So he's like, hey, it's hey, Vern. Like, that's like the old catch. He's like, hey, Vern. He's driving him to like the airport or something, and he gets in this huge. And well, you never, no, 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 that's not the same guy. Vern, you never see his face. Vern is always a can't, yeah. But so that premise, because that's the thing is, I was so confused at that scene as a kid. I was like, why does Mm -hmm. Ernest show up at this guy's house who clearly (laughs) hates Ernest, and then Mm -hmm. Ernest just like destroys his house? (laughs) That was the premise of the the commercials. So the commercials was always like Ernest being like, hey, Vern, like, have you tried a. Orange Crush, yeah, like the yeah, drink, yeah, and then yeah, and then yeah. all this mayhem would happen. Because in this and, movie, uh, he's like buying a Christmas tree and sets the Christmas tree up at the guy's house, and he's destroying. His I house always think the, about the cord. He's yanking the cord yeah. as it's just like tearing through the wall <laughs> yeah, and everything, yeah. and it's just like complete mayhem. And yeah. I think that's actually the only Ernest movie where they oh. do the Vern dynamic. I don't think oh, they do okay, that for okay. any of the other ones, oh. but it's it's a throwback to the old commercials, okay, which I never knew you. till way later. So that's really interesting because that is totally confusing when you're a kid yeah. watching that and not having any of the context. It's just this you're random just like, little sequence that you're yeah, like, okay. It's yeah. totally weird. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the things that's just weird about that movie in general. Yeah. But, Man, uh, how crazy though, would it would have been in the I, early 90s if we had gotten like a road movie starring Ernest and Pee Wee? Yeah. Like yeah. that would have been the that's shit. That's what they would have done nowadays, a crossover yeah, mashup yeah. movie like that, right? That's what they the would do. Man, the multi man, the multi man child <laughs> universe. Uh, they probably get Mr. Bean in there as well. Uh, yeah, for yeah, for all we know. Maybe throw Ace Ventura in there. I don't yeah, know. Something yeah, something like that. But um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, there, and then there was also kind of how his uh, his how Santa's sack works. That's another thing that I always think yeah. about: is the girls keeps on reaching in to like she she like wants something cool, and she reaches in, pulls out a. Uh, this magical orb and then it transforms yep. into some bullshit and she's like ah oh, more kid stuff I can't remember she wants like a I ghetto you blaster or something it's or like a, once you take it no no she wants like millions of dollars I think. oh yeah yeah <laughs> but or like, like some jewelry um, cause that's what every five year old asks for like, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you one know, million dollars in clean, uncut bills yeah. in an envelope, right? Uh, but I was like, I guess once you pull the toy out, you can't put it back in the sack because right, it's like all this stuff was. Out. I remember because like I was, like, you, I think you've seen it. Like I've got a my pet monster, mm-hmm. and that's actually one of you don't see that getting pulled out. But when she's like hiding all of the toys she's been pulling out, there's like mm-hmm. a my pet monster. And as a kid, I was just like, you selfish bitch! You've got an amazing toy right <laughs> here you could be playing with, but no, you got to keep going for more. Yeah, yeah, um, just wasn't what she was looking for yeah but um yeah no it's uh yeah it's a great little uh i feel like at the end though doesn't santa like give her something that she really wants or something she like she like gets a nice gift maybe I i'm making up i think memories. what I happens m- she must get something i would hope that she at least gets like a mm. fucking train ticket home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh i think like the gimmick was she sort of learns the error of her ways yeah right so she like there's a sequence where she's a, a apologizing to Santa. Mm -hmm. And I think the movie just ends with Santa being like, Hey Ernest, you want to be like my helper? Mm -hmm. And then they're almost like, screw it. You want the girl to come along too? And she's Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And so it kind of just ends with them all joining Santa on. on, And so you really, it's like, yeah, it's really hard to know what you don't get a lot of uh, insight on what really happens to Ernest or that girl after that night. Yeah. Right. Right. But, um, yeah, I guess you just kind of have to assume like she's going to go back home. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, again, maybe we're just forgetting it. Maybe she does uh, call home or or they maybe plant some sort of seed to show that something's going to happen to her. But um, but yeah, she's kind of just like this runaway the whole time. Mm-hmm. And I also kind of like how the movie kind of ends with like hinting at Santa maybe getting a little bit of pussy with this like old <laughs> this like old kind of quaint like clearly like a Mrs. Claus type except she's probably oh. like actually 80 and he's like 2000 years old or whatever <laughs> but um did you, do you know the character I'm talking about um, she's like this old lady who I think she was like doing yes um, yes yes I, I do remember now that yeah. you mention it yeah because they were kind of having this bit of a romance a blossoming romance I think romance. that's literally the end of the movie they're on a bench she's like what are you gonna do now it's like well yeah. I was one time Santa Claus yeah and, uh, right, right. <laughs> now I'll uh, plow you on Christmas, I guess. Uh, but um, I totally am going to rewatch this movie uh, this holiday season. 
And everybody else who's listening out there should totally watch this movie too. Ernest Saves Christmas. Yeah, and you don't totally actually, worth, you do not need to see the other Ernest movies no, to, no. to enjoy this film. That's a great thing. They, they work as standalone movies. Yeah, but, you can um, watch them in any order. Mm-hmm. On that note, but that pretty much wraps up our, our list of things to talk about. I think we covered quite a bit there, and we're going on to two hours and 38 minutes here, so. You sure you don't want to talk about Krampus? Well, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save I mean, it for next year's Christmas episode. Yeah, yeah. We got to save some for... Yeah. Although I, I do recommend watch Krampus because it does have... It really does have that um, that christmas feel mm-hmm. is it's it's like almost exact it's like it's that christmas yeah, feel like a dark a dark christmas on steroids kind of yeah well great. it's the guys who did trick or treat so oh, think right. about yeah, what yeah, they yeah. did with halloween it's Fuck, it's what they amazing, do with, with with christmas yeah damn it i'm gonna add that to my list for this yeah it's, it's a fun one too yeah but any, but anyway everybody we thank you for joining us we hope you heard about some good things that maybe you want to check out one of these and uh, we gave you some ideas of stuff that you'd want to watch but uh, that's our been our Christmas wrap up for 2023. Hope you had a good time, as good of time as we did. Oliver, do you have anything you'd like to add? Have a holly, ollie Christmas. <laughs> oh shit! I wish I had a good sign off line like that, but I don't. Kevin roasting on an open fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thanks. a little too morbid. All right, yeah. It's not a pleasant thought at all. It doesn't rhyme with chestnuts either, but yeah. yeah. Oh well. Well, anyway, it's been I fun. I saw Kevin kissing Every- Santa Claus. Yeah, I don't yeah. know about that either. <laughs> Fuck. I could maybe make like a Kevin reference to... Uh, no, here's all. All I have to say is, Kevin! <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's perfect. Perfect. Oh, I can't believe I didn't, uh, we didn't think of that. Okay, that's great. That's, uh, yeah. that, that's actually a great way to end it. On that note, everybody, have a Merry Christmas. We hope you had fun. We wish the best to you and your family, loved ones, and uh, we will see you in the new year, 2024. Kevin Rosmer signing off. Happy Kwanzaa. (laughs) Good night. (laughs)